Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourselves. It's August the 21st, 2022. And we're about to begin another episode of World Discussion with Agent Smith. I'm going to join him in voice chat and we will now talk about the world. Agent Smith. Smith. Hello? Yo. Hey, how are you? Pretty good. We had a fairly straightforward raise this weekend. I played some Dota 2 and got raged at for a good two hours. And the amazing thing is, in the games when I was raged at, we won all the matches. And they were <laughs> still mad at me at the end of it. Wow. Yeah, it was really cool. There was a person who was claiming that I did nothing the whole game. And I didn't use my brain at all, and all I needed to do was use my brain. And it, it was a good teaching moment because I think giving feedback to your teammates after the match is a totally valid practice, but it should be a specific game adjustment that you want them to make. What they were doing was just like broad insults of, you're just a very stupid person and you should never play this game kind of a thing, rather mm -hmm. than we needed you to be more aggressive using this ability. We needed you to use these items differently. So for me, I wasn't really rustled or offended because they weren't really specifically calling out parts of my play that they had issue with or that they wanted me to change. They were just kind of blanket insulting someone. And uh, that was that was interesting. And then I got into the next game and the same thing happened. But we won both <laughs> matches. I was able so basically to... the normal MOBA experience. Exactly. Yeah, par for the course. <laughs> I've reported four people today for communication abuse. It's hard for me to get offended personally when they don't actually have anything that they can articulate. Mm -hmm. I was waiting for something, like something specific that you want me to do better. Sure, I'm down. I ha I'm certainly not a high level Dota player, so there's a lot of stuff that I can learn, but they're also playing at the same tier as me, which means that sometimes they don't know how to articulate what they want different from you. They're just throwing out insults because they can. That's why I don't play those. Yeah, it is a bit of a battle, a mental battle, a spiritual I battle. Patience. Yeah. I really like the gameplay of Dota 2. I think it's a very well built and elegant game. The community is certainly the worst part of it. Mm -hmm. World of Warcraft Classic, it brought back that assessment to the community again because there were a bunch of things in the original iterations of WoW that just gave the players a lot of freedom to grief each other, just to ruin another person's day. In more modern game design philosophy, they usually put more bumpers on player behavior where you just can't do certain stuff that will be really annoying. And when they bring back Classic, there's the question of, is PvP going to be enjoyable and fun with these old freedoms? Or is it going to be as bad as it was before or worse? And we learned in the lovely human psychology experiment of Classic WoW that people grief each other so hard that the faction that's outnumbered will usually just mass leave the server. So what's left now are a bunch of completely one-sided servers that are basically all Horde or all Alliance. The faction with fewer people, they would just get grinded basically by whole bunches of guilds outside of the raids and they would be killed multiple times, which ultimately means sometimes a half hour to an hour of guild operations that they can't they can't do anything they can't even get into the raid because the other faction is killing them because they have the numbers advantage and that's not really fun it's not like oh wow look at their ability to coordinate their attacks and they found this really cool landscape to use against us it's just like there happen to be more players of this faction on the server so you're fucked gg so they just left the servers so we effectively have only a few PvP servers left. It used to be a really popular and common thing, but now the PvP servers that exist are pretty much all Horde or all Alliance. So it's not, maybe not the game that's the problem, it's the, the people who really like griefing. 
If you give them the ability to grief, they will do it. Sounds like it. Who runs those servers? Blizzard. No, oh, they still run their own? Yeah. They're pretty hands-off with the game compared to original WoW Classic where they had more active game masters who were whispering people and monitoring people's behavior and responding to tickets. They do still have the ticket system and responses, but there doesn't really feel like as much presence as there used to be. It is a legacy game, so they probably have more of a skeleton team than, say, modern retail WoW. Mm -hmm. sure. But that's cool. The guild has been doing well. We're rounding out the rest of this phase. Uh, the next expansion thing is coming out in September, so we're looking forward to that. That'd be cool. Yeah. And I also got one World of Tanks stream in on Thursday. I'm doing a sponsored thing for them. Now, what kind of tank did you choose? I was doing artillery, which I had not really? done before in the game. And it is super fun when you hit shots and get kills from way across the map. So wow. it was like trying to find out where the battles are forming up. And you need your ally tanks to get vision of the enemies to be able to find them and shoot them. So the, the regular tanks are going in and they're finding their spots and trying to shoot people. And then I'm trying to find a spot that has access to pretty good high ground so I can shoot over stuff if I have to. And I'm also obscured from direct enemy fire. So the spots that chat was recommending me to find would be on the backside of a hill. So I'm hiding behind a hill and I shoot over the hill anywhere on the map where my team is getting vision. And then you have to factor in the delay time of what it takes for your shot to get over to that spot you're shooting. Yeah. Really cool. Wow, that's pretty neat. Yeah. I didn't know they let you do that. Yeah, they have... Artillery is its own kind of class of tank in the game. You've got, like, the heavy, medium, and light tanks, and then the artillery. Hmm. Pretty cool. Yeah. Are you going to keep playing it, or is that more of a one-off thing? Uh, I have two more streams of it. I'll probably do that next weekend, most likely. Mm -hmm. One hour for each one. I was supposed to do three one-hour streams, but uh, I had a lot of fun on Thursday, so I think I ended up playing it for more like two hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Taurus, who hangs out around the stream a lot, and he also streams himself, he's huge into the history of tanks and he was pointing out which ones in the game were more so just prototypes but they didn't actually see real combat in any major conflict it was like japan wanted to design the heaviest tank and it had a crew of 11 or something and they never actually used this in a conflict but they still had the design and then they put it in the world of tanks game huh interesting choice yeah. What? I guess that's one of those alternate history type things. Yeah. Do they let you... Uh, but it's got, like, warships, right, in it, too? There's another game. So they have World of Tanks, World of Warships, and I think there's a Planes one? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe Chad I think knows. Because so. I remember War Thunder is their competitor, and they have all three in the same game. Hmm. Although you don't play them in the same matches. Mm -hmm. But I remember the Japanese had a uh, aircraft carrier submarine. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the experimental tank made me think of that. I wonder if they let you use that. I don't know. They actually did build it, though. So they made it further along than the tank. The aircraft carrier submarine? Mm hmm Nice. Yeah, it couldn't carry very many aircraft, as you can imagine. Well, it also can't go underwater with the aircraft on top of it, can it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They keep the aircraft inside. Huh. And they were not particularly sophisticated aircraft. They were uh, seaplanes. Mm -hmm. So they were basically just designed to drop a few bombs. And I don't think they could carry more than, like, maybe two or three of them. 
So they were, it was a very specialized vehicle. I think the original target they had in mind was the Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. I think they wanted to launch a surprise attack and try to disable it, put the US Navy at a strategic disadvantage. It would be pretty inconvenient not to have access to the Panama Canal, especially during World War II. Mm -hmm. Although it would still be pretty inconvenient even now. So the Japanese designed these uh, weird little submarines. And uh, they successfully built, I think, like two maybe, something like that. And they actually did send them on the mission to strike the Panama Canal. But I think before they could get there, they ended up getting recalled. Because they wanted to use them as uh, suicide ships or some damn thing. Basically to defend the motherland. By that point, the invasion of Japan was kind of pending. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to try to marshal as many forces as they could get. And uh, I think by the time they got back to Japan, the war was mostly, had pretty much ended. And so they decided to scuttle the ships. Rather than letting them fall into the hands of the Americans. What does it so mean, they built scuttle? Them. Uh, they sank them. Oh. They sank them themselves. <clears throat> so uh, they built them successfully, and they actually did work, but they never saw any action. So uh, that's a good thing if you're the U.S. Navy. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it kind of denied us of uh, what would have been one of the more interesting little episodes in World War II if it had actually gone through. That's pretty interesting, the different research and development that happens in the military of projects that they might start with a cool idea, but it doesn't end up being a really practical scenario where you want to have a big investment. Because making equipment like an aircraft carrier or even a plane or a boat of some kind is hella expensive. So you want to yeah. make sure you're getting good value from that and it's not just a novelty thing. Yeah, generally it was the more wealthy countries in the war that were able to experiment like that. So like uh, creating a super plane that has incredibly long range and can carry a very heavy payload. You know, that was basically a super project. Mm -hmm. And effectively only the United States could really afford to do that. And so that's actually how we got the B-29 which, uh, for those of you who maybe don't know what the B-29 is, that was a long-range bomber that the United States built during World War II. And uh, they did not have plans for it when the war started. It was something they started developing pretty quickly after it started. And, uh, of course, normally the development cycle for a new aircraft, even then, was relatively long. So they had to accelerate it. And uh, given how complicated the aircraft was, it's actually kind of a minor miracle they were able to pull it off but they did and it was one of the more impressive achievements of the war hmm. yeah it was uh it had just miles and miles of circuitry in it it actually had its own computer each aircraft had its own computer in it it was a very early computer it wasn't nearly as sophisticated as the one you know we're using right now but uh technically they did have computers and they actually had computer-guided anti-air guns on them. You know, I mean, if you're familiar with World War II bombers, you know that they had uh, machine guns on them to defend themselves against fighters. But generally, they were manned by people. Uh, but the B-29 actually had a uh, targeting system controlled by the aircraft's computer that allowed for automated uh, gun aut automated guns. And uh, they would actually use rudimentary radar uh, in conjunction to some inputs from the gunner to uh, basically automatically track targets. Uh, I don't know how well the automated firing mechanism worked. So I don't know that it was like fully automated. But uh, the gunner basically had much less work to do than a typical gunner because the system would actually show you where to point the weapon. Uh, in order to hit it. Yeah, there was actually a YouTube video that um, 
what was it? It was actually a training film from the war explaining how to use the gun. It was like a training video for gunners. And uh, it was really neat. <laughs> I definitely recommend it if you're interested in uh, World War II. Very sophisticated uh, technology for the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, they did manage to develop it before the end of the war, and that's how we ended up with them. Also, another example of a super weapon that only really the United States could afford is, of course, the nuclear bomb. Uh, to be fair, we kind of did that in conjunction with the British. They also contributed a lot to that development program. And we also benefited from uh, dissidents from Germany. A number of German scientists obviously came over before the war and made themselves available for the program when it started. So that uh, was kind of a international program to a degree, not purely a U.S. program. But most of it was paid for with U.S. funds. So in that sense, it kind of reflects uh, the unique position the United States was in in order to fund something like that at that stage. Other countries Germany just contributed had... scientists and whatnot? Yeah, yeah. Britain contributed science, scientists and maybe some funding. But the U.S. definitely carried most of the load. You know, the facilities necessary were built in the United States and were largely funded by the U.S., for example. Mm -hmm. What was that? Oak Ridge in Tennessee? I think that was the main one. Yeah, Germany had a nuclear weapons program, but it never went anywhere. And from what I read, uh, the German scientists involved in the program were brought to the United States after the war, and there they were, you know, surveil surveilled in order to kind of observe them and maybe pick up tidbits of information. And of course, they were also interviewed and interrogated. And uh, from what was learned, it seems like it was never actually going to happen. That is to say, Germany was never realistically going to develop a nuclear weapon because their scientists were just way behind mm -hmm. and they were kind of on the wrong track theoretically. How are they on and the wrong track theoretically? I don't remember the details exactly, but basically their approach to building the bomb was just wrong, huh. but they hadn't quite figured that out yet. It may also have been that the program was being sabotaged from the inside out, and maybe that some of the scientists were actually secretly dissidents and were kind of purposely doing it wrong, but I don't think that's ever been proven one way or the other. Mm -hmm. But they also knew that like a nuclear bomb had the potential to be the next stage in weaponry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't a stretch. Like, people under... It was, un, you know, the theoretical underpinnings for a nuclear weapon were already there. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, Germany, the United States, and Britain, and so much of it was part of the program, all knew that and had their own programs to try to build one. But ultimately, it was only the Anglo-American program that went anywhere. I'm trying to think of some of the other experiments. I mean, Germany obviously had a number of experimental systems that they developed. Those were the famous uh, wonder weapons. Have you heard of these? Hmm... It sounds familiar. You're probably like the V1 and the V2, for example. Mm, I don't know what those are. So one of the things that Germany did near the end of the war is they started trying to develop a lot of advanced weaponry. And they were called wonder weapons because the expectation, by the government anyway, certainly by Hitler, is that they would be sufficiently advanced to allow Germany to win the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them were really impressive. So the V1 was effectively a cruise missile. It was basically a rocket that you could launch and it had an, iner an inertial navigation system that could be adjusted so that the uh, missile would fly to the general area of a target and then would drop, you know, dropping the bombs, pay dropping the missile's payload in that area. Uh, so very rudimentary, you know, they couldn't exactly hit specific targets, but they could get it into the general area of a target. and and then drop uh, drop the missile on top of it. But still, pretty impressive. 
Hmm. effectively the first cruise missile. They launched a lot of those. I think it was several hundred, maybe several thousand V-1s at the UK in the last year or two of the war. And uh, they didn't, you know, they couldn't really hit anything specific, so they were not really strategic weapons. Um, mostly, I think, he was just trying to terrorize the population of London. London was the principal target. Uh, he kind of just wanted to intimidate them into surrendering, you know, pulling out of the war. Which didn't work, no surprise, but that didn't stop them from trying anyway. Yeah, I think it ended up, in a way, backfiring because the it galvanized the British more so than scared them. And it may have been more reliable just as a military strat to like try to hit their planes or something. What, for the V-1? Yeah, just for the, the bombing efforts against Britain. You can try to hit random people, but that doesn't really affect military capabilities. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You know, that's why uh, the British were able to win the Battle of Britain. You know, the Germans shifted focus away uh, from the Royal Air Force and toward cities, and that gave the Royal Air Force time to recover. So, yeah, fair point. The trouble with the V-1s, though, is that they just weren't accurate enough to target military facilities. Mm. So in that case, it wouldn't really have been effective. It was probably a bad idea to bother in the first place. The resources that went into building all of those V-1s could have been put towards other things. But, you know, by that point in the war, the German government was gambling pretty heavily in a variety of regards. Yeah, interesting trivia about the V-1. They actually were not hard to shoot down because they actually flew relatively slowly. Hmm. And so British fighters were actually able to kind of spot them, you know, flying in from Germany over the channel. And they actually took to uh, shooting them down. Sometimes they didn't even have to shoot them down. Sometimes they would actually tip them over. What they would do is that they would fly in close next to it and then they would use the uh, air moving over the aircraft's wings, that is to say their aircraft's wings, and use it to destabilize the V-1 and cause it to flip over. Huh. And uh, it would actually just fall right into the channel at that point. That's funny. I'm imagining the the really slow, you know, those bullets in Mario that move toward you and you can kind of like duck under them or move out of the way. Like it's a thing that would hit you really hard, but it's so slow that you can just look at it and then decide what your plan is going to be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Similar phenomena here. So let's see, that's the V1. Uh, let's see. And then the V2. So the V2 was actually basically the first ballistic missile. It was a large rocket, and they would launch it up into the, what, lower orbit? Maybe the stratosphere, more likely. And then it would just fall. You know, it would have a warhead, and then it would, uh, you know, hit the arc at the top of the, uh, well, it would, the missile would fly up in an arc, and then at the top of the arc, the, war, the payload, which would generally be a large warhead, would separate, and then it would fall into a given target area. And again, not very accurate. They could, you know, they tried to target London because that was a sufficiently big target to be worth targeting. But that was about all they could, re all they could reliably hit. Mm. And uh, they didn't build as many of those as they did the V ones because they were much larger and hence more expensive. Uh, but still, impressive technology. They were basically the first in that sort of area to develop that kind of weapon. And of course, that was the predecessor to the modern day intercontinental ballistic missiles, you know, by which countries would hypothetically nuke each other in the event of some kind of nuclear exchange. And in the V-2's case, they were actually hated by the British. Maybe we've got some British people listening and they can correct me on this, but from what I remember reading, uh, the British public didn't like the V-2's. Uh, they disliked it much more than the V-1, because with the V-1, uh, not only was it easier to detect coming in, and not only was it easier to shoot down, but you could actually hear it as it was in coming near to the city. And that actually gave people time to kind of, you know, go to a shelter or something. They had a very distinctive sound to them. But with the V-2, there was no warning. Like, from the, you know, the Germans were able to launch it, you know, really high, into a very high altitude. And uh, that made it impossible to detect early. And there was no way to detect it when it was, when the warhead was on the way down. It would just fall so quickly. There was just no way. They didn't have the technology at the time. 
So with the V1, there would be warnings and a chance to stop it, but with the V2, there was no warning and no way to stop it. So the only way that people knew uh, that a V2 attack was coming was after it happened. And generally, because the warhead was relatively large, those did a lot of damage, much more so than the V1. So you could easily have just been walking around, minding your own business, living your life in London, and then there would have just been a huge explosion somewhere near you. And uh, that would have been a V2. Like, no warning, just minding your own business, and then bam. You know, giant fucking missile just blows up a chunk of the city out of nowhere. Damn. Didn't really change the course of the war at all, but, you know, the Germans, again, just trying to gamble on wonder weapons and whatnot. They had some other cool stuff. Uh, King Tiger, you know, the famous big tank, although they actually did develop that, and they were able to, I think, fight one or two battles with it. Well, probably more than that, but uh, I don't think it was able to change the course of the war by the time they were able to field it. Just a very large, impressive tank. You know, German engineering being what it is, it was pretty cool. It just wasn't very mechanically reliable. You know, the trouble with German machinery and German weapons in particular and vehicles in World War II is that a lot of them were just too sophisticated for their own good. You know, you can have a lot of cool ideas to put in your vehicle, but uh, a lot of the time the trade-off is that maintenance issues become more and more of a problem the more sophisticated the engineering becomes. Yeah. And in the case of... Hmm? Fewer people can fix it, and you have more technical parts to replace that can fail. Yeah, exactly. And generally, the failures are more frequent, the more points of failure there are, mm -hmm. of which there's generally a lot in a sophisticated vehicle. So in a lot of cases, you know, from the midpoint of the war on, when they started fielding Panther tanks, Tiger tanks, what have you, the problem that the German army would have is that something like... Uh, a very large proportion basically of their tanks would just fail on their way to the battle because they would just have maintenance issues and so that almost was as big of a problem as the red army like they just couldn't go into combat with 100 percent of their tanks because just so many of them had trouble uh traversing from one location to another you know when they worked they worked pretty well but the trouble was they did not consistently do so I think the Germans also developed the first assault rifle, technically. I don't remember what it was called. Actually, that's a good question. Let me look that up. German rifle. Oh, Stig 44. Okay, that's what it was. So technically they were the first to do that, and then they were also the first to develop uh, night vision goggles. Hmm. So they weren't, well, actually not goggles, I shouldn't say night vision goggles, it was a night vision scope, and they put it on their tanks. I don't think they were able to deploy it until like late 1944. They actually used it in the Battle of Budapest, I think. Wasn't able to change the outcome of the battle or the war for that matter, but again, just kind of cool trivia, you know. <laughs> We're talking about these experimental technologies that countries developed, and so that was one of them. So, yeah, Germans definitely had some wild stuff at the end there. They also had like this rocket plane that they designed to be an interceptor, because obviously, you know, Allied uh, air superiority was one of the big factors uh, that they were having to deal with there. You know, the German Air Force basically had to redeploy a huge chunk of their forces, I think the vast majority of their forces in Europe, uh, to Western Europe, away from the Eastern Front, in order to deal with that. It's probably the main contribution that the Western Allies contributed up until 44 with the, uh, well, 43, and we also invaded Italy, but you know that's, that's a whole other conversation. But uh, yeah, in order to try to deal with all these Allied bombers coming in, uh, from Britain, one of the little technologies the Germans worked on was this interceptor airplane that was purely rocket powered. Like it didn't have an engine, it didn't have a jet engine, or it, none of that. It was just basically a plane with a rocket in it. And they would just fire it at the uh, incoming waves of bombers. And this thing had, you know, decent enough weaponry. And uh, they would fly around and try to shoot down the bombers. And because it was rocket-powered, it was really fast. So that made it really hard to shoot down 
on the part of the uh, bomber gunners. The trouble with it is that it had a very limited range, so effectively you could only use it if the bombers were almost flying directly overhead. You know, you couldn't launch it and have it fly like, you know, 20, 50 miles, whatever, to try to intercept the bombers. The bombers basically just had to come to the launch site. Mm -hmm. And I guess since we're talking about aircraft, there's, of course, the uh, uh, Messerschmitt 242, I think it was. So that was actually the first combat jet in history. You know, jet technology, that is to say jet engine technology, had already been in development for a while, but nobody had made a actual warplane that could fly and fight and whatnot. So the Germans were technically the first to do that. It was not very reliable. <laughs> kind of fitting with the theme there, the German engineering. You know, it was really cool and sophisticated and advanced for its day, but uh, it broke down a lot. Sometimes the engines would just quit mid-flight. It's not really what you want on your pilot. Yeah, yeah. But when they were working, they were pretty lethal. They were able to rack up some pretty decent kills, intercepting Allied bombers and whatnot. I think the biggest problem they faced was aviation fuel. They just didn't have enough to keep them in the air very much. And jet planes need a higher impact kind of fuel than regular yeah. planes. Well, fuel in general was a problem for them almost throughout the war, but especially at the end there. So that was the bigger issue, just a shortage of any kind of fuel. They didn't have any reserves and they had limited refinery capacity. You know, they depended more and more as the war went on on synthetic fuel. Yeah, while Romania was in the war, they got a lot of oil from them since they were a significant oil producer, not really a major one, but they produced more than any producer in Germany did. But then, of course, Romania was overrun by the Soviets in uh, 44, and so then they were cut off from that supply. So that really squeezed them. And it wasn't really until 44 or 45 that you saw the, uh, I think somebody in chat posted 262. Okay, the Messerschmitt 262 wasn't deployed until there at the end of war. I should throw out the usual disclaimer now before I, <laughs> before I dig any deeper here. Uh, I'm not an expert in everything I talk about on here. I'm more economics, foreign policy. So if I ever say anything wrong, stupid, or biased, please do correct me if I'm wrong. I want to know more than anybody. Uh, so participation in chat is encouraged in that regard. I don't read chat normally. I just kind of happen to have it open right now. But uh, I will read it later. So I'll see it eventually. And I do learn a lot from chat. You know, one of the fun things about doing the segment deal we got here is uh, kind of learning new things and getting feedback. Twitch chat is a really awesome hive mind. You have a bunch of different people who have different careers and areas of expertise and stuff. And if you have a few hundred viewers, you'll have quite a bit of knowledge that any individual doesn't possess on their own. Thanks, chat. Pretty cool. But yeah, German wonder weapons, there was also the first, the Germans during the war developed the first air-to-ground missile, which they actually did use at one point. And it was actually, I think it was actually television guided. What? Television? Yeah. I mean, television already existed, I think as early as like the 1930s. That was when the technology kind of first appeared, but it wasn't like anywhere near ready for mass production until uh, I think like late 40s, early 50s or so. But the technology did exist and the Germans actually used it to uh, develop a missile that would be connected to the aircraft by wire. And uh, actually it may, have been, it may have been a gliding bomb, I don't quite remember, but Regardless, it was a munition, and it was attached to the aircraft, and they had a little television, and and the, there was a camera in the munition by which somebody in the aircraft could guide the munition into the target. And they didn't build a whole lot of those, but they did develop it, and I think they used it to blow up a bridge at one point or something. Those Germans are pretty smart. Mm-hmm. Never really built a four-engine bomber, though. And war is one of those situations, too, where they often get a whole bunch of resources to spend and figure stuff out. 
more so than just your random passion science project. Yeah, I don't think the British really did as much of that, but I do remember Churchill having some weird ideas. I don't think I can remember many of them, but I do remember one. I think there was uh, Churchill had this idea of building an aircraft carrier out of ice. And the idea was that it would be unsinkable because the ice would be basically too thick for one, but also it would just inherently float, <laughs> just being ice. So the idea of an unsinkable aircraft carrier was pretty attractive, given all the problems with U-boats that the British were having. But it ultimately ended up being unfeasible. It just so the British. It just makes me think of that jokes on you. I'm into that shit when there's the iceberg in the water and a boat is coming up to an iceberg. It's like, <laughs> we're gonna sink you. Too bad. I'm also made of ice. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty wacky, wonky idea, and it didn't go anywhere. It was just too technically difficult. You know, they basically would have had to have carved an aircraft carrier into a glacier and then somehow added a propulsion system to it. It just wasn't really feasible. But it was a weird idea and so we remember it as such. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with Japanese efforts to develop experimental stuff. You mentioned that tank, so there's that. Mm -hmm. And there's the submarine carrier. <laughs> yeah, they were kind of more bare bones. They were kind of busy coming up with like biological weapons and chemical weapons and stuff like that. That was kind of more their thing. Here's some trivia for you. I don't know if you know this. We may have talked about it before at some point, so I apologize if I'm being redundant. But, uh, during Japan's invasion of China, uh, one of the things they did, I think about three years into the war, like 30, I want to say more like 40 or 41, basically when the war was kind of at an impasse, there was a deadlock in the conflict after a while. And uh, one of the things the Japanese did in order to try to break Chinese resistance was that they took these bombs and they filled them up with, uh, I think it was like ticks or something, you know, some kind of blood-sucking insect. And uh, they infected them with bubonic plague. Or maybe it was, uh, well, anyway. Plague pass, you know, plague uh, spreads via sort of the ticks on rats and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they got a bunch of plague-infested ticks and put them in these bombs, and then they dropped them over... Uh, Sichuan province or maybe it was like uh, western Hunan but basically the front line and the idea was that the bubonic plague was spread and it would cripple Chinese resistance and I don't think it ever actually happened but it's notable just by dint of them trying it at all because we don't really think of biological weapons being used in either of the world wars really chemical weapons yes obviously chemical weapons were used in World War I but not really so much in World War II but the Japanese actually did. They actually used both biological weapons and chemical weapons in their war with China. They didn't use them at first, but they definitely did later. And then a biological weapon has some organisms involved in it, whereas a chemical weapon is just like the raw materials. You're saying the ticks or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they took out the warhead and they just put ticks and stuff. It sounds goofy, but it works. Yeah. Oh, fleas. That's the word I wanted. Fleas spread the plague. So it would have been fleas in the bombs, not ticks. Getting my wires crossed. You know, going back to the British, I do remember that they developed a lot of weird systems for uh, D-Day. So these were maybe not experimental systems per se, but they were practical utility vehicles. 
So one of them was uh, the flail tank. Have you heard of this? No. You know what a flail is? Yeah, like a medieval flail? Yeah. 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 So what they did is they attached a roller, right? You know, like a steam roller. It's got the big roll in the front. Mm -hmm. So they attached a roller to the front of a tank. And then they attached a whole bunch of flails to the roller. And so the roller would spin, and then the flails would you know, fly around with the roller. And uh, the idea was that the chains that were attached to it would impact on mines in front of the tank and detonate them. And uh, that was actually pretty effective. That, that actually did work. And so one of the ways that uh, paths were cleared on the beaches in D-Day is that they would use those. Hmm. Yeah, I think the British called those funnies. They had a couple of different sort of wonky designs like that for special purposes. The U.S. wasn't as good at that. <laughs> we tried... We tried to develop uh, some amphibious versions of tanks so that there could be, you know, so that we could land tanks on the beach on D-Day and support the infantry. But uh, most of the American tanks that were so modified ended up failing. They ended up sinking into the ocean before they could make it back to the beach. So it did not end up being a very effective effort there for the U.S. That was one of the reasons Omaha Beach was so, was so bad. They did not have uh, armored support like they were supposed to, and which other beach, and which other beaches did enjoy, which is why they were relatively more successful. Armored support being tanks. Yeah, yeah, tanks. Hmm. <laughs> they didn't have the tanks that they were supposed to have, so it was basically just infantry versus fixed fortified defenses, <laughs> which never goes well. You got to have a lot of infantry to make that work. Yeah, and it doesn't work well for a lot of the infantry, even if you do win. Do you know how night vision goggles work? Uh, there's different types. <laughs> I don't, you know, if you're asking me how the Germans want, how the German system worked, I don't. No, I, I think I could guess <laughs> for the sake of argument. I think in that case, it's just amplifying existing light. Because mm -hmm. there are some that work like that. Uh, actually, maybe no, maybe that's not it. All right, I don't know. That's the real answer there. But there's basically two ways that I'm familiar with. One is amplifying existing light. And then another one is actually projecting radiation which then is reflected off of, you know, stuff, and then you can pick it up with your scope. Mm. Yeah, that type of night vision is actually how a lot of commercial night vision works. So there's actually like a little light that they, you can't see it. It's like, I think it's infrared light or something like that. But they'll have like a little infrared light and it'll shine. And then that allows the camera to pick up the, uh, to see basically mm -hmm. so in that case you basically have an invisible flashlight if you want to put it like that yeah that makes sense I think some of the most modern systems actually use a combination of stuff because I remember reading about a system that combined infrared vision with night vision so it amplified existing light while simultaneously uh seeing so to speak infrared images so it could see heat in other words so what it would do it was a, it would take the enhanced light and then mix that with the image of heat to produce a combined composite image uh, for the person viewing uh, through the system hmm. and supposedly that gave you a much better quality uh, night vision than you could get before yeah the classic night vision is kind of a grainy green white image that you get yeah yeah it's not the best quality so they've been working on that by trying to mix it in with other sensors mm -hmm. but yeah, was there any sorry go ahead it's cool hearing about different 
technologies that were innovated and how a lot of them, the first iteration of it kind of sucks, but then they're onto something that is eventually good and then does eventually become basically a standard equipment for every country's military, like night vision stuff. Yeah. Yeah, every technology starts out new at some point. Some of it is sexier than others. Yeah. <laughs> there was a time when radio was new. And that was the hot new thing that people were trying to incorporate into the military. Operational security was uh, not always good as a result. <laughs> some militaries were better at others than recognizing how easy it was to pick up those signals. Mm -hmm. you know, the Russian army in World War I in particular was bad about that. Debatably, they haven't learned much since then. <laughs> going yeah. by going by what's happening in Ukraine right now. Yeah, for a different reason, though. Yeah. There was a funny news item that I saw that, I don't know if it's going to end up being anything substantive, but Dennis Rodman, <laughs> who some people have called the dictator whisperer, has claimed that he's going to go to Russia and get the basketball player back. Oh, <laughs> uh, really? Yeah. I don't think that's going to work. Why not? Well, the negotiations uh, for her release, as well as the release of a uh, different American. I think he's like a former Marine. Uh -huh. uh, negotiations for their release have already started. Mm -hmm. And most likely the Russians are going to try to use them as bargaining chips to uh, get the release of Russian, of Russian agents that the U.S. is holding right now. So that's a pretty decent bargaining chip to have, and I don't think they're going to let it go because Den Dennis Rodman asks them to. Mm. So most likely that basketball player is going to stay right where she is until those negotiations are finished. That would be my guess anyway. Yeah. Some well, people were, they were speculating that if they did just agree to do this, it would make the Biden administration look weak like they couldn't handle the negotiations themselves but he could swoop in and do it this guy is he's such a character he tried to I think it was like in 1996 marry himself I don't know of anyone else who's even thought of that actually I read an article about that recently about him specifically or just other people trying to do that uh, people marrying themselves in India Huh. Kind of an odd case. Although in that case, it has more to do with uh, kind of a self-love, self-respect thing. It's like a little ritual some people are doing because they're having trouble finding a partner in like urban India. Mm -hmm. I thought you were going to say that it was like giving some tax benefit. Oh, no. <laughs> nothing so nothing so logical. Okay, question. <laughs> if you marry yourself, but then you make out with somebody. Did you just cheat on yourself? <laughs> Is that infidelity? Probably not. <laughs> you're, you're not really cheating on an other person. So I would imagine not anyway. Has to be some separate person involved, I would guess. Well, ethics of, uh, I'm not even sure what that would technically be called. Because it's not monogamy. Unogamy? No. Well, whatever you want to call Unagi that. Unagi is, that's an eel sushi. <laughs> that's different. <laughs> <laughs> A little different, yeah. Do well, you mind if I take a quick break here? Go ahead. You just pop out. I'll hold down the fort. Chat, behave. See that? We're fine. Okay, they're going air. We've got a Skyton player here, chat. And I've lost like five overlords. They just went around, pop, pop, found them all perfectly.
I don't know if it's going to be the carrier build. I think it is. That would make the most sense because they're going for the upgrade and they've only shown one void ray. So I want these spores to be pretty tight between each other. And I want to mass queens and get other stuff. Nonogamous makes me th you think nine partners. Yeah, people do some interesting and entertaining stuff. The thing that weirds me out about Dennis Rodman is like trying to aim for friendship with someone who's a dictator with like crazy human rights abuses. It's like, isn't there, aren't there some moral qualms here? Sorry about that. All good. Drank a little too much green tea for my own good. Yeah. Green tea is a fairly healthy beverage, though. Oh, sorry, did I say green tea? Yes. I meant sweet tea. Okay, that's less healthy than green tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Apologies. Well, was there any particular item you wanted to kind of hit on here? Uh, I didn't really see anything that majorly jumped out at me in the news this week, aside from the meme Dennis Rodman thing. Aside from the Dennis Rodman thing. Yeah. Well, we could do a little bit of Ukraine. I've got some stuff on that. Sure. Let's see. Did we talk about the uh, explosions in Crimea? Mm, not last week. Let's see. So there has been a there was a couple of those. Uh, it wasn't clear who was responsible. It's happened, I think, t in two separate incidents. And supposedly a good chunk of the U Russian Navy's naval aviation has been grounded as a result, although they didn't have much to begin with. Uh, but that had been nominally the target in the first attack. It doesn't seem to have been HIMARS, that is to say the long-range missiles that the United States gave to Ukraine, uh, the rumor at this point is that there's a group of Ukrainian saboteurs who are operating in Ukraine. Possibly civilians, but probably Ukrainian special forces would be my guess. So there was a video online of some beachgoers in Crimea kind of being alarmed at a sudden explosion happening not far away. That was the first incident. And apparently there's been something of an exodus of tourists from Crimea after the fact. The war kind of being brought home for a lot of people, it seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't really want to have bombs going off or explosions on your holiday. Kind of kills the vibe. A little bit. A little bit. Uh, there was supposedly, allegedly, we don't have proof of it, but supposedly some Ukrainian saboteurs also attacked some electricity pylons within Russia itself recently. That was in the uh, Kurchatov area, sort of northeast of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So that hasn't been proven one way or the other, but it would kind of fit into this trend of uh, Ukrainian special forces raids. Let's see, there was another big hacking of Russian media. Hackers keep targeting these uh, cable TV networks in Russia, so periodically you'll see a video or a picture or something of uh, cable TV in Russia showing some anti-Russian, pro-Ukrainian message or video or something. Mm -hmm. So there's another one of those recently. I was reading an analyst online talk about... Uh, how Russian artillery may be running out of ammunition, for one. They have a lot, but they're blowing through it very rapidly because, uh, as we've talked about before, Russian military doctrine very much emphasizes artillery. Mm -hmm. But because the Russian army is having so much trouble in Ukraine, they've been trying to compensate by using even more artillery. And so they've been blowing through their stored uh, ammunition 
even more rapidly than they would if they were just using the normal portion. So that's brought into question just how much longer they can kind of keep up the pace. Uh, Russian industry is going to be able to produce some, but it's not clear that they'll be able to produce anywhere near enough to meet demand at this point, given how quickly they're using the ammunition. So there's lots of guesses there about what's going to happen. It's not entirely clear just how much stored ammunition they have left. And also the Ukrainians have been targeting ammunition dumps in uh, occupied Ukrainian territory using the HIMARS weaponry that the United States sent. So that's also been having an effect on the availability of uh, artillery ammunition for the Russian army. I think in general people think they'll have enough, certainly for the next several months, but after that there might be an issue. That said, I would speculate that they could probably buy that buy Russian, uh, well, not Russian per se, but they could probably buy artillery shells from places like China that already have a lot of old Soviet artillery shells stored up. Mm -hmm. So they could probably get some from them. And, you know, Chinese manufacturing is pretty decent. So they could probably uh, get some manufactured there. Although, in general, Chinese firms have been pretty reluctant uh, to trade with Russia. Uh, because, you know, they're afraid of getting targeted by sanctions. But I think in China, a lot of the military equipment is produced by state-owned firms. And I think a lot of those firms have already been targeted by the United States uh, to try to cut them off from the most, from the most modern uh, inputs, things like microchips, uh, heavy machinery, manufacturing equipment, what have you. So it may be that those particular firms may not have as many qualms about selling to Russia. And so that, make it, that may make it more feasible uh, for the Russian army to source artillery shells from them. But that's just speculation on my part. <clears throat> yeah, another interesting item I read about Russian artillery was uh, the barrels. There was a guy on Twitter talking about that, how uh, artillery sh barrels can only be used so many times basically before they have to be replaced and uh it's not clear if the russian russian industry has the capacity to actually replace barrels obviously they have some in storage so that'll last them for a while but one of the things that happened in the 1990s is that a lot of skill sets uh that had propped up you know the soviet military industry during the cold war collapsed and the result is uh, those skill sets just disappeared and are no longer available. And I read that one of the skill sets that the Russian military uh, industrial complex, so to speak, lost was the ability to construct their own barrels. So artillery barrels, tank barrels, what have you. So if they need to produce a lot of new barrels for artillery, that may be a major bottleneck for them going forward. And given how heavily they're leaning on artillery right now, they're probably going to approach that tipping point pretty rapidly. So artillery shells and artillery barrels are two things to keep an eye on as far as the Russian war effort. It's not known exactly how many they have in storage or just what capacity they're going to have to either produce them or source them. Uh, so those are all open questions, but those are all questions that the Russians themselves are going to have to ask because that is stuff that they're going to need pretty soon. So if I had to guess, I'd say they're going to find some way to pull through, although they may not be able to use artillery as heavily as they have been because artillery shells and barrels will be relatively short. That is to say, in short supply, so they'll have to ration it a little more. But I think the probability of them suffering some kind of collapse, you know, a significant shortfall in uh, the usage of artillery, I don't think that's kind of pending. It's possible, but I would imagine that's an outside possibility. I would think the Russians would be more resilient than uh, to allow that to happen. Let's see, and then another item I read regarded smuggling. So Russia imported a lot of their heavy machinery. Again, that's manufacturing equipment. They imported a lot of their manufacturing equipment 
uh, from Europe, specifically Western Europe. And of course they can't do that now. So that begs the question of where they're going to get new equipment uh, as well as how they're going to maintain the existing equipment that they have. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the maintenance is actually done by the uh, OEM, you know, the original manufacturer. So when the manufacturer cuts you off, that can be a problem. Yep. And that's the problem that Russia is facing right now. And uh, one of the ways that Russia could get around, you know, the sanctions restrictions on exports of, you know, machinery, among other things, is that they could try to buy the equipment in a third party country and then import it from that country. And the Russians have been trying to make that happen. One of the things that uh, Vladimir Putin did during a meeting with Recep Erdogan, the president of Turkey, I think a month or so ago, was that he asked him if Russian banks could set up uh, basically correspondent accounts in Turkey. And the idea there is to set up uh, basically to make it possible for Russians to pay for stuff in Turkey. Because the SWIFT banking system has locked Russian banks out, or at least most Russian banks. And so in order to get around that, Russian banks have to revert to the system that banks used uh, to transfer money between themselves that existed before the SWIFT banking system was created, which is a much more analog system, which involves a lot of, you know, correspondent accounts and paperwork. I think they've even started using fax machines again. So hypothetically, that could work, but the Turkish government has to allow them to do it. And the Turkish government has been pretty non-committal on that. So it's unlikely to happen. But the fact that the Russians are asking suggests that this could be, uh, that is to say, Turkey could be one of the third party countries that they might try to use to try to import some of the banned stuff that they can't get through normal channels anymore. So there was one analyst online uh, who was saying that uh, the European Union and the United States need to focus more on Turkey to make sure that they're not acting as a smuggling hub for supplies and equipment that the Russians need but cannot import anymore legally from the West. So I haven't seen much focus on Turkey thus far from Western diplomats, at least as far as the whole Ukraine issue, but uh, if significant smuggling is found to be taking place, then I imagine that's going to change pretty quick. <laughs> They're probably going to focus a great deal on Turkey at that point. And given how uh, reluctant Turkey is going to be to kind of give ground on that. I imagine we're going to have to give something in exchange for their cooperation on it. And the Turkish government doesn't like getting pressured very much. So generally, if there's something you want them to do, you're going to have to pay them off somehow with some kind of quid pro quo. Let's see. Other than that, there's a new support package that's kind of making its way through the U.S. government. So... The U.S. is going to send more stuff, basically, to Ukraine. I think it's more ammunition, some more artillery pieces, more drones, probably money, too. Although I don't know as much about that. It's generally not... Cash is not really specifically mentioned in the list of stuff <laughs> that we give them. But I imagine some of that is happening to some capacity. It may be in the form of loans, mostly. Because that's a little easier legally to justify than just straight up grants and aid and whatnot. But there's probably some of that happening as well. Oh, and then there was the big news today. Maybe you heard about it? The assassination attempt today in Russia? Uh, was it someone's daughter? Was it that one? Yeah, that was the one. Yeah. So it was not his daughter who was being targeted, probably. We don't know a lot of details right now. But most likely, the original target was uh, Dugan, sort of the pseudo-philosopher who pushes a lot of Russian nationalist ideas. Mm. We've talked about him before. You know, he's the guy that came up with the idea of the Russian world, so to speak. Yeah, and we speculated early on in the conflict that one of the driving forces between invading Ukraine was a lot of this guy's ideas of bringing them back into that fold. And having that bigger vision of Russia that was more similar in geographical expanse to the USSR. Yeah, yeah, his ideas are very popular with Russian nationalists, so mm. he contributed to it. 
contributed to the logic of the invasion. So they tried uh, the to Russians. kill this guy's daughter? No, they tried to kill him. Oh. He was giving a lecture at a festival in Moscow. Mm -hmm. And uh, they put a bomb in his car. Whoa. And uh, he was going to go home with his daughter, but apparently, from what I was reading in the BBC article, there was a last-minute change of plans. And uh, his daughter ended up driving home alone, deciding to drive home alone, and he had some kind of alternative arrangement. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was when she turned on the car that the bomb went off, and that killed her. Damn. Yeah, so he survived, but not by much. It was just pure luck on his part, it seems. Mm -hmm. So the Russian government isn't too happy about that, as you can imagine. Yeah. The Ukrainian government denies any and all responsibility. It may not have been Ukraine. You know, uh, it may have been dissidents within Russia. Mm -hmm. It's hard to judge. You know, again, it's early days. And the Ukrainians haven't really been assassinating philosophers thus far. You know, when they assassinate people, they're assassinating people in occupied territory in Ukraine itself. You know, collaborators, Russian army guy, uh, Russian soldiers, you know, officers, people like that. And uh, more recently, there's been some raids into Crimea itself, near as we can tell. And maybe to a degree, some raids into Russia, but there hasn't been, to my knowledge, any assassinations within Russia. Mm -hmm. Certainly not any targeting like high-profile figures like that. So if it is the Ukrainians, this is something new for them. Mm -hmm. Also kind of a weird choice. If you're going to go into Russia and assassinate somebody, why would you target a philosopher? Why not go for a politician? Although I guess you could say maybe they're trying to send a signal. Maybe they're just trying to show that they can assassinate people and they decided to make an example out of Dugan whom is, you know, a high-profile figure, but he's not politically powerful. You know, he's just kind of an, an idea whose ideas... He's, an, he's a guy whose ideas uh, have become sort of widely embraced by certain parts of the Russian nationalist community. They but might himself... They might have expected hmm? him to have less of a security detail than someone who was, like, more directly part of government and politics. Yeah, that could have been it, too. A soft target. Yeah. So a soft target and a target who's not politically sensitive. So in that sense, he may have been attractive to try to signal that this is something they might do in future if the war goes on. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. That's pure speculation on my part. We'll see what comes of it. So yeah, some excitement there. But other than that, I don't think the front line has changed much. I think mostly it's kind of still stagnating. You know, the Ukrainians are still trying to push into Kherson Oblast, and then the Russians are still trying to uh, take what's left of Donbass, specifically Donetsk Oblast. I think they took all of Lugansk. Or maybe it's the other way around. I don't quite remember. But they're still technically fighting there, trying to take the Donbass. That's all I had for Ukraine for today. Not a whole lot of dramatic stuff happening, at least that I know of. Taking things a bit further north, did you see the uh, Prime Minister of Finland enjoying <laughs> some uh, fellowship in merriment and then getting called out? Yeah, that was goofy. Yeah. That's how you <laughs> know that you're really low on news in your country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they actually made her... Well, they didn't make her, but they actually pressured her into taking a drug test. You know, some of the opposition was saying, you know, this kind of brings into doubt whether or not you're professional enough for the job. Oh, man. You know, we would like for you to take a drug test, and she actually agreed to do it. Although she resented it. She complained about it the whole time. <laughs> she said she didn't want to, but she would do it just in the name of uh, professionalism, basically. Yeah, the weirdest thing about that was the video leaking at all. Like, who leaked that? That seems weird. Like, the only people there were the people at the party, right? Yeah. So then how did the media get a hold of that? Yeah, someone... I would say ratted her out, but since she didn't do anything wrong... It's like, it reminded me of the Michael Phelps bong rip picture that was leaked. <laughs> yeah. Man. 
The guy's an American hero. He's the best swimmer of all time. Really inspires a lot of kids and adults. My WoW character was named after him. I thought Michael Phelps was awesome. He had a crazy good work ethic. He also wasn't really unsportsmanlike at all. He set a good example. He would be excited when he won, but he wasn't mean to people or egotistical like a lot of other professional athletes. And God forbid, he just ripped that bong and someone was like, this is news. <laughs> We're going to fuck him up. And I think he did lose some sponsorship deals and stuff as a result of it. Yeah. So yeah, he did. This is in a similar vein of someone who's well within the department of an adult having a, a fun time with other adults, but not in a way that's hurting anyone and everyone's consenting to the merriment but there's party poopers out there stay safe fortunately so i kind of wondered maybe if the russians hadn't done it maybe they hacked into the phone and got it and tried to embarrass her because of the whole nato accession thing yeah but there hasn't been any evidence to that effect you know i would have imagined that uh finnish intelligence would have said something by now if they suspected Mm -hmm. but I haven't heard anything so I don't know just one of those things mm. was there any follow up on Mar-a-Lago is it still same same and that's a, a process yeah I don't think there's anything new there nothing that I've read yet Lots of talking, but not a lot of doing yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, I saw the names of the agents were released. Which is not really something that normally happens. I hadn't seen that. Like the agents who did the raid? Yeah, I think so. And the FBI released their names? No, I think it was Trump or somebody who was at the Mar-a-Lago property. Leak. Yeah. Oh, that's dumb. Yeah. You know, I was reading uh, more recently, I guess today, uh, that a lot of Trump's preferred picks in uh, primaries are winning mm -hmm. at local levels, that is to say. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of the uh, general elections, like uh, for the Senate and the House that are coming up in November, a lot of the candidates the Republican Party is going to run are looking to be uh, Trump guys, mm -hmm. at least in the um, competitive districts, that is to say. The article I read didn't really talk about the uncompetitive districts so much, but it's the competitive districts that are going to swing power one way or the other, so people disproportionately focus on those. What is an uncompetitive district? Like, everyone knows who's always going to win there? Yeah, it's like a one-party district. You know, all It's right. either always a Republican winner or always a Democrat winner. Mm. So in sort of the purple competitive districts, uh, the GOP is disproportionately running Trump guys, and that's probably not a good thing, I would guess. Just going off of like uh, polling data and whatnot, in general, people in a lot of the purple competitive districts tend to be more skeptical of Trump, relatively speaking. Mm-hmm. So if the GOP cannot produce moderate candidates in those districts, it's relatively more likely than that they're going to lose those districts. So the Republican Party had been looking like it was going to kind of sweep uh, come November in the election, but maybe not. It's a little unclear right now. There's certainly a lot to criticize Democrats for, but at the same time, Republicans have not really been able to fully leverage that advantage, it seems. Mm -hmm. And Trump has not been helping in that regard. So like a lot of things in this era, the midterm elections this November could be a surprise. And God knows we need more surprises. Yeah. So that'll be something to keep an eye on. Why do you think there would be a, a swing to the right? If they can get moderate? Well, that candidates? had just been accepted purely because it's normal. Like mm -hmm. generally, uh, just because of anti-incumbency. 
mm-hmm. whichever party controls the house uh op- well generally the party party opposite of the president will win the house in the next midterm mm-hmm. that's not it or at least the uh the president's party will lose seats so that combined with all of the inflation and the Afghanistan pullout and the other controversial stuff, as well as some of the, you know, fake partisan bullshit stuff. There's always a lot of that all over the political spectrum. So between all of that, it seemed like the Republican Party had a big advantage. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the predictions were that they would handily win both the Senate and the House of Representatives. Uh, but since then, things have changed a little bit. There's been some legislative success on the part of the Democrats getting some of their stuff passed, like the Inflation Reduction Act, as well as the Infrastructure Bill and the CHIPS Act. And uh, inflation kind of sort of is going down, depending on how, depending on how what specific aspect of inflation you want to look at. It's either getting better or worse. So Democrats, of course, are looking at the early indicators here saying it's about to go down if it isn't going down already. So that's helpful to them. And uh, Trump, of course, is always of assistance if you're a moderate. So they can point to him and say that if you don't vote for me, then you're going to get radical politics of some kind. Mm -hmm. So that'll win you a lot of districts, but it's probably not going to win you the competitive ones. And so that's also resulted in some predictions shifting into more not necessarily favoring Democrats, but suggesting that results will be more unpredictable uh, than we were expecting earlier. Hey, what do we have here? Do you want to talk about Sikhs or did you want to do more World War II stuff? Uh, Sikhs would be cool, kind of like a follow up to last week on India. Yeah, Sikhs are interesting. I just had a note here about an assassination in Canada Ooh. a couple of weeks ago, and it actually ties into Sikhs. So it could be fun to just kind of talk about them a little bit. Sure. So for those who don't know, Sikhs are a religious group native to India, or maybe specifically South Asia more generally. And uh, they're a relatively young, so to speak, religion. They didn't really start up until, I want to say, like the 1400s or so. And uh, originally, it was started by a guru who wanted to kind of take the best ideas from Hinduism and Islam, both of which were present in India by that point, and try to create something new, you know, a kind of a syncretic religion. And uh, Sikhism was the result. Uh, Well, I might add here as an aside, it's actually supposed to be pronounced Sikhism, and adherents of the religion are called Sikhs. Uh, but we here in the United States are special. <laughs> so, and now we pronounce things. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so the relevant religious authority uh, for Sikhism in the United States actually gave special permission to Americans to call them Sikhs instead of Sikhs. And uh, from what I was reading, anyway, they did that partly because uh, the word sick obviously has a different meaning Mm -hmm. uh, in English than it does elsewhere. That's apparently not a problem for British English speakers. I think they actually do call them Sikhs. Uh, But in America, we're not as familiar with the Sikh religion. And so they have basically said, fine, just call us Sikhs. We're cool with that. So I'm American (laughs) because I have special permission, apparently. I generally refer to them as Sikhs. Also, it's just less confusing for Americans in general, because, again, it's kind of an obscure religion if you're not really familiar with Asian religions, South Asian religions and South Asian cultures. So most of our audience is American. So for their benefit, we'll go with Sikhs for now. But uh, yeah, Sikhism started up in the 1400s. And uh, it was a syncretic sort of movement started by a guru who wanted to mix the best elements of Islam and Hinduism. And for a long time, it was very peaceful. I mean, it's always been peaceful for the most part, but at that time, it was especially so. I'll get into that in a minute. But uh, the way that uh, they organized it was basically just gurus and then their students. So the initial guru would teach a bunch of people, and then they would go out and teach people. 
and etc. Now the original guru himself still technically was the leader. I think he was one of the main contributors to the holy book that uh, of Sikhism. I don't remember what it's called off the top of my head. Maybe somebody in chat can help me with that. Uh, but there was a holy book written technically. That's sort of the basis for a lot of uh, Sikh ideas and whatnot. And uh, you know, there was a temple that he kind of used as his main base and he taught people from the temple. His students went out and taught, but invariably the center of the religion remained the original guru. So what would happen is that the guru would pass leadership on to his children. And so leadership of Sikhism became hereditary in that sense. And uh, again, for a long time, that's all it was. It was just like a guru. There were some people who liked his ideas, and so they adhered to his ideas, you know, practiced the ideas in his holy book and whatnot, and sometimes worshipped at his temple. And that worked up until, I think, the 15 or 1600s or so. And what happened then is that there were some issues with the Mughal Empire, I believe it was. Uh, the Islamic Empire, the Mughal Empire was an Islamic Empire, and uh, they didn't really appreciate religious min minorities that much. Uh, the Mughals were better than some of the other ones, but, you know, even they had issues. And so they went to this guru who was leading this new nascent growing religion, and they told him that uh, they were going to have to need, they were going to have to ask him to convert to Islam. And of course he said no, and they executed him. So that was a problem then for followers of Sikhism. You know, not only had their guru been killed, uh, and actually that ended that line of hereditary gurus. You know, after that it was other people, other students, who kind of picked up the slack uh, and became the new leadership. So not only had their leader been killed and had the hereditary line been wiped out, but also followers themselves also started to be targeted. So it was at this point that Sikhism developed a kind of militant strain to it. You know, there was a sense that people had to defend themselves. And so that was integrated into the customs of the religion. And so as a result, it's expected that, uh, you know, Sikh adherents are able to defend themselves. And uh, I think the specific rule that I remember is that uh, Sikhs, well, Sikh men specifically, always have to carry a knife with them. And uh, from what I was reading, that's partly a legacy of this period when they had to defend themselves from discrimination and repression uh, by the dominant Islamic empire at the time, the Mughal Empire. Uh, interestingly, Sikhs actually still practice this custom, um, but they don't obviously carry around, you know, combat knives and stuff. That would make airport security a bit of a problem. So the uh, compromise uh, is that they carry around a small ceremonial knife, you know, basically just like a symbolic knife, and that ticks the box, technically. They technically, they're honoring the requirement to carry a knife. I don't know how useful it would necessarily be in actual combat, but uh, they do carry it. And uh, from what I've read, you know, one of the other customs in Sikhism is that the men are supposed to cover their hair, uh, which is why you so frequently see men wearing, uh, Sikh, Sikh men specifically wearing that uh it's a kind of turban. I don't know the technical name of it. But basically, it's a special, you know, Sikh hat that they wear, and uh, they're very in they're very easy to identify by that headwear. You know, it's very much associated with Sikhism and Sikhs. So they're supposed to cover their hair, and they're also not supposed to cut their hair. So what they'll do is they'll actually put their hair up in a bun, and uh, they'll actually stick the ceremonial knife in their hair just to kind of keep it out of the way. I don't know if everybody does that or if people still do that, but that had been the, you know, that had been sort of the compromise custom in order to kind of allow traditional customs to be adhered to in a modern context. Mm -hmm. So Sikhism was able to survive, partly because, uh, you know, partly because they were tough and able to defend themselves. Punjabis in general have a reputation for that. Uh, but also because the British eventually came and they had more of a hands-off approach to religion. And uh, that allowed them to kind of proliferate more than they might have otherwise. As a side note here, I might mention that there actually was a Sikh confederacy at one point. That was actually a sort of small Sikh empire up in northwest India that existed for a very short period of time before the British conquered it and subjugated it. So skipping ahead a bit, 
uh, in general, I think Sikhs were more nationalistic. They were nationalist Indians like everybody else was. And uh, they tended to lean more towards the Congress, you know, just because of tension with the Muslims. Uh, that was communal tension that had kind of always existed, but it, communal tension got worse in the lead up to independence in India, uh, especially like the 1930s and 40s. And uh, that created some bad blood there. So that kind of inherently made Sikhs a little more favorable. Well, it made them predisposed to be more favorable to the Indian National Congress as opposed to, say, the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. So skipping ahead a little bit, partition was particularly hard on them. Because Punjab state was one of the two states that was basically cut in half by partition. And uh, there was a lot of violence that came as a result of that. And a lot of that violence came in the form of Sikhs and Hindus uh, in the western part of Punjab relocating to India. You know, it's not as though they were necessarily forced, although there were lots of cases where they were forced, uh, but also just in the process of migrating, you know, by land uh, across the border, a lot of them were the targets of uh, Muslim militiamen of one sort or another. So a lot of Sikhs were killed as a result. Uh, I might add here that the same was true for Muslims living in eastern Punjab. They were also targeted by Hindu and Sikh militants as they were trying to escape across the border. So it wasn't just the one group, but both of them. So lots and lots of violence in this period. It was very rough on them. Uh, but eventually the result was that Sikhs became easily the dominant demographic group in uh, Punjab, or at least what we would now call Punjab. So it, there was an adjustment period after independence, but things kind of settled down. Uh, but eventually what happened is that there was a Sikh nationalist movement in Punjab. So there had been Sikhs in the Indian National Congress, and you know they ran for office in Punjab and kind of ran the province on their behalf, but uh, the Punjabi Sikhs were not really satisfied with that. There was a religious group that had ties to the uh, principal Sikh religious authority. I think it was called the Akali Dal or something like that. And uh, that political party became the voice of Sikhs in Punjab. And the big thing that they wanted was to carve out a majority Punjabi speaking state because the Punjab territory at that point included a lot of non-Punjabi speakers. So they would have preferred a purely Punjabi speaking territory because that not only would have been you know, easier for governance, uh, just to have the one language, but it also would have meant a majority Sikh province. And of course, the Sikh nationalists wanted that. Mm -hmm. So the Indian government did not want to do that. They were very reluctant because they were afraid it might lead to demands by other religious groups for special treatment. And they were also worried about separatism. They were afraid that eventually the Sikh nationalists might try to declare independence uh, in Punjab so that they could have their own Sikh country. Now, the British, well, not the British, the Indian government was only able to put off those demands so long. But eventually, in the late 1960s, uh, Congress's popularity collapsed. And uh, as a result, the Akali Dal were able to win power in Punjab. And at that point, Congress was much more willing to concede ground uh, as far as carving up a new state, which they did, which is how we get the modern state of Punjab in India. Now, there was kind of a back and forth after that between Congress and the Akali Dal sort of competing for power. Uh, but one of the things that happened within the Akali Dal is that the main leader ended up going on a hunger strike. This is before the state was sort of cut up into a purely Punjabi speaking state. Uh, the leader of the Akali Dal went on a hunger strike and he demanded uh, that the Indian government concede to the demand for a purely Punjabi speaking state. And at that time, the Indian government was unwilling uh, to give ground. And so he actually quit the hunger strike before uh, he was able to achieve anything. And a lot of people within the community criticized him for that. You know, they said, why didn't you die? You know, why didn't you continue to starve yourself until death? You know, you're supposed to really believe in this. How can you still say that you're fighting for us when you do this? Strange logic, maybe from a Western perspective, but, you know, from the context of uh, Indian politics, it kind of makes more sense. You know, if you're a major religious leader and you declare that you're going to go on hunger strike and demand some kind of concession, you're supposed to go to the mat for it, you know, technically. 
So the result of this was that uh, he took a popularity hit. And there was a different leader that kind of sprung up uh, leading a different group who said that he was going to lead the, you know, the Sikh community going forward because this guy had kind of lost confidence. So after that, you know, even after they were able to successfully get their purely Punjabi state, uh, there was kind of a three-way political battle between Congress and the original leader of the uh, Akali Dal and then the new leader of the competing party that was set up after the incident in the 60s with the failed hunger strike. And it was that breakaway party that actually ended up being the problem because uh, they were much more militant than the uh, original organization that they'd splintered from. And uh, they actually were the ones, I think starting more in like the 70s, that actually started demanding independence for Punjab. Now through the 70s, that was not like a very popular position, but it started to gain popularity over time, especially as the Indian government became less legitimate. That had to do with the uh, emergency that Indira Gandhi declared. You know, she declared an emergency so that she could have emergency powers and basically rule India as dictator. So that was a pretty controversial move, as you might imagine, and that resulted in a huge amount of dissent uh, all over India. And one of the big beneficiaries in Punjab of that was the Akali Dal, and uh, also Punjabi separatists, which were again a different group. So that fed into a growing movement for what was called uh, Khalistan, which was supposed to be the sort of new country that would be purely Punjabi and majority Sikh. And the Khalistan movement gained traction in the early 1980s, until there was a major incident in which, I think we may have talked about this last week, but I'll mention it again here. Uh, there was a major incident wherein the militant Sikh separatists stormed the temple at Amritsar, which was like the main temple for Sikhism and remains so to this day. And uh, he said that he wasn't going to leave until the Indian government gave concessions on Punjabi independence. Now, of course, Indira Gandhi didn't want to do that, and so she ended up sending in the army. And they cleared them out and a lot of people died and Sikhs were very upset about that, even the ones that hadn't necessarily agreed with them. And so there was enough Sikhs sufficiently upset about it that eventually uh, her two Sikh bodyguards even got upset about it. And they were the ones who ended up assassinating her in the early 1980s. So during this period of Sikh militant activity, one of the things that happened is that there was a Canadian passenger plane that was blown up in a bombing and it killed something like 329 people this would have been uh, 1985 and generally uh, the authorities responsible for investigating this accredit the attack to Sikh extremists who had migrated to Canada and were living there and supposedly the attack was revenge on India because the aircraft attacked was an Air India aircraft so the investigators said that the attack had been revenge by Sikh extremists uh, for the storming of the Golden Temple in Amritsar in 1984. And the revenge came when? 1985. Okay, so the next year. Yeah. Now, there was a lot of people who were investigated for this, but all of them ended up getting acquitted in 2005, according to my notes here. Now, one of the guys they'd been looking at, who they believed was responsible, was a guy named Ripudaman Singh Malik. And he was a Sikh businessman living in, I think it was Vancouver. And a couple weeks ago, or maybe it was a month or two ago, uh, he was assassinated. Whoa. And some dude drove up to his house. And uh, they have security footage of the guy you know, driving there and you know entering the house. And it's not entirely clear what happened. Uh, but later on, Malik was found dead from gunshot wounds. And, uh, you know, maybe it was just like a personal thing. You know, maybe it was like a personal dispute or some kind of business disagreement. But the police suspect that it was foul play, that it was a, that it was an assassination. You don't usually was... just go drive to someone's house and shoot them because you didn't like a business decision. <laughs> yeah. It was also su suspicious because uh, the guy who drove there well, the car that the assassin had driven there was later found burned. It had been left on a nearby street and set on fire. So the suspicion is that he may have been trying to cover his tracks there. Mm -hmm. 
I don't have a lot of follow-up on this. The notes I took were like immediately from immediately after the killing. Mm -hmm. So the, there may have been some new development since then. But uh, at the very least, this guy associated with Sikh extremism uh, seems to have been targeted because of possibly because of his involvement in the terrorist attack on that passenger plane. Mm -hmm. And as another note here, Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, actually got in trouble uh, with India, specifically the Indian government, because he kind of sort of accidentally met with a Sikh extremist. <laughs> you know, from his perspective, I think it was just like a rally or something. And so he met this guy who was like a leading, you know, Sikh representative there. He was a big, he was a big shot in the Sikh community in Canada. And, uh, you know, he just met him, talked with him, did like a little photo thing. You know, there's some photos of them shaking hands and stuff. And he probably didn't think anything about it. And he only found out about it later uh, that this guy had been like a major separatist, a major leader of the separatist Sikh extremist community mm -hmm. in India, and that he was basically living in Canada in exile. So the Indian media were pretty quick to pick up on that. And there was a big shitstorm over it in India that, you know, this Canadian leader was uh, cavoiding with a uh, major extremist uh, in India. Well, from the perspective of India, he was a major extremist. Yeah, so there's a little... I could see just like you're doing your standard leadership stuff of trying to network and show that you have a presence and a care for various different kinds of communities. And there's not the time in the day to be able to like vet the past of every single person you shake hands with. <laughs> So he's just like going around. Oh yeah, hey, how's it going? Yeah, I'm good to see you, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, you did what with who? <laughs> yeah, pretty upsetting. So Canadian diplomats had their work cut out for them there. Mm -hmm. They were eventually able to smooth it over. You know, Sikh extremism hasn't really been a big factor within Indian politics for the past 30 some years. It kind of withered over the course of the 1980s. So by the end there, it wasn't nearly as much of a force as it had been. I had a friend from the Math and Science Academy that I went to who was sick, and she was not allowed to cut her hair. That was one of the features that I noticed. Also, there was a lot of religious pressure on her to find a, a nice Sikh man to settle down with. <laughs> she was not too thrilled about that as a priority mm -hmm. well endogamy is sort of a big deal within a lot of south asian communities well pretty much all of them it's a south asian civilization thing you're, you're kind of supposed to marry within group yeah there's big... there's still a similar thing even for christianity in the u.s is there yeah man well maybe you're not from a family that's heavily christian but that's something that uh, family will often ask about like I went and I had a a nice lunch with an aunt and was telling her about somebody and I was asked what is her relationship with the Lord and I was like oh man <laughs> people refer to it that way still nice I get weird nostalgia sometimes whenever uh, Christianity is talked about like I don't really have a a rustling reaction where I get upset. I think the early period, you knew me back when I was processing everything still and more recently an atheist. And I did have my angry atheist phase where I was like trying to free people from the the lies of religion and all that kind of stuff. And then I kind of... And to proselytize. Yeah, a little bit. And then I had settled down and I was kind of like, yeah, some people, they get a lot of mental peace and security from some of these ideas and stuff and maybe they have good social support in these groups and maybe they enjoy their faith as well and it's like eh, is it worth for me to like go on a reverse crusade kind of a thing not really and i also do feel a just a general sense of solidarity with my family i don't really want to be a a family nemesis it's not really my stance that i want to take so i do still go to church with my parents and stuff when I visit for holidays. Part of it is curiosity too. I'm kind of interested to see what pastors are saying these days and stuff. 
a lot of ideas in church have gotten more moderate over time. You'll still mm -hmm. find radicals. It's not hard to, but yeah, a lot of just the general ideas of acceptance of other people and groups and stuff is more common than it used to be. Well, in South Asia's case, it's more about um, sort of extended clan groups rather than necessarily wanting to preserve a particular religion or tradition or some such. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Sikhism, they're not like immune to that. Mm -hmm. you know, that's uh, There's this idea of a gotra, which is like the extended clan group within you know a given community. And uh, you're allowed to marry within that but there are also certain rules. I think it's that, uh, what was it? <clears throat> if you marry, you can marry your cousin, basically, according to the custom, and that's fine. But if you marry a cousin who's the daughter or son of your parents' sister, then it's technically incest, and you're not supposed to do that. Hmm. Or maybe it was brother. I don't quite remember all of a sudden. But basically, yeah, there's like specific rules and there's a big taboo about breaking them. Like you're, there's specific groups that you're supposed to marry within, but there's also specific people within that group who you can't marry. But otherwise, like within a Western context, you would not have the same kinds of hangups. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just kind of, you can marry anybody. Like, uh, like even in the case of your example there, like, they care if they're a Christian, right? But they don't necessarily care about, like, ethnic background, per se. Nope. Yeah, so that's more open. And also not really which type of Christian, which means it's a pretty broad umbrella. Yeah, type of Christian, or like a caste, or, you know, something like that. Yeah. So, you know, in South Asia, there's a lot more rules that you have to kind of uh, adhere to. And so Sikhs do the same thing, pretty much. You know, you're, you can kind of marry who you want so long as it ticks the right boxes. So I think a lot of the younger urban westernized Sikhs don't really do that as much, I would imagine. You know, they're probably a lot more open-minded as, as far as, you know, who they uh, cavort with. I think I said cavoit earlier. I was thinking of cavort. <clears throat> so kind of more of an open-minded approach to, you know, dating and marriage and whatnot. But traditionally speaking in South Asia, like everybody is almost obligated to maintain the integrity of their group however you want to define group and there are a multitude of rules to that effect whereas in the west it's kind of more anything goes you know as far as like cultural traditions european tradition is like the libertines of global traditions it's like just do what you want we don't even keep our women in our houses neuro can you believe it yeah. <laughs> Can was... Go outside, have jobs, and also go to yeah. school. Well, even historically speaking, like even before women could do that kind of stuff, like it was normal just to let women leave the house and even just allow guests to see them, mm. which had not been the custom in, say, the Middle East or South Asia or even China. Like it was normal that women kind of were kept out of sight and had specific areas that they were supposed to stay in. Yeah, China wasn't as bad about that, but definitely South Asia and the Middle East had customs to that effect. And a lot of commentators from the region who traveled to Europe kind of found it notable that European women were allowed so much discretion in where they were allowed to exist, basically. You know, like they would go and visit somebody and the women would just kind of be milling around doing stuff in the same room as the men. And they found that quite surprising. So we're just totally out of control, Nero. <laughs> we have no self-restraint in our civilization. It's kind of weird because a lot of those old traditions are so distant for us because you're basically in an area where a lot of the basic freedoms have always been there. And then you hear about places where it's the opposite case. In Quite a bit of culture shock out there for those looking for it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. Did we have any questions? I think you've just been kind of asking them as they've appeared, haven't you? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> what? Would you be interested in some World War II by chance? Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> Who was I telling someone? I was telling someone that World War II was like your war and how there are a bunch of different wars that have been fought over time, but you can't really focus on knowing a lot about all of them at once. Yeah. And that's your Unfortunately so. Your main one. Well, I guess I could ask you, is there like a specific theater you would be interested in learning more about? Uh, I know very little about Africa, what happened there, but I think oh, there was Africa. a decent bit of fighting that went down. Mostly North Africa. Mm -hmm. That was the main theater there. Yeah, the British, uh, well, the British relationship with Egypt was a little weird at the time. Generally, it was considered part of the British Empire. So if you look at a map of the British Empire at the time, generally Egypt is included, but it was not really like a colony, per se, of the British Empire. You know, there were definitely British officials there. They had a resident who lived there and who, quote unquote, advised the government. Uh, the advice was not generally voluntary. Generally, they were required to follow it, lest there be consequences of some kind. Uh, but technically, Egypt did maintain its own government in this period. And they did have their own king, who tended to be very much aligned with the British, mm. and whom nationalists did not particularly get along with. Uh, but otherwise, it was pretty autonomous overall. It wasn't like some of the other places Britain conquered, where they had direct British rule over the territory. Yeah, a lot of the British, British control was kind of implicit by way of uh, control over loans, infrastructure, control of the Suez Canal, what have you. So that was sort of more of a case of indirect control in, that, in the case of Egypt. But anyway, regardless, uh, the British had a pretty decent number of military forces deployed there, you know, naval and army. And then, of course, air assets as well, I guess. And so uh, the British effort kind of focused on defending Egypt. That was sort of, well, the Suez Canal obviously was like the main strategic asset. So they were particularly concerned about that, but also just def defending the territory in general. And uh, they had a lot of other asset. Well, they had a, a lot of other territories in Africa, uh, but Egypt was the main one that was targeted by the Axis. And it was pretty much the only one they realistically could target. Uh, I should say that there actually was other fighting in Africa besides Egypt. <laughs> to give you an idea, uh, it was almost all Italy at first. Like the Germans weren't interested. They were focused on like uh, fighting France and then, you know, kind of trying for Operation Sea Lion. That didn't work. And then they focused on Soviet Union. Uh, the Italians, meanwhile, were pretty much solely responsible for North Africa at first. And at first they made a lot of headway. They actually made pretty good progress in pushing the British back. But eventually the British were able to turn the tables on them and it was looking like they were going to be ejected. Now the main Italian colonies in Africa were Libya and Ethiopia. So Libya is the one people are probably more familiar with because that's the one that they launched their invasion of Egypt from. And it was mostly northwestern coastal Egypt and then the coastal Libya uh, that a lot of the early fighting in North Africa happened. So places like Tobruk, uh, El Alamein, you know, these kinds of places are mostly within Libya and northwestern Egypt. Those are all like famous battles in the North Africa campaign. But Ethiopia is much less well known. And uh, the Italians actually conquered it in 1936, I believe, it, it had not been all that. It hadn't been all that much before the war started. They had actually had Eritrea much before that. Eritrea was like uh, one of the first territories they'd colonized in Africa, and they actually took it from Ethiopia. I think it had originally been Ethiopian territory, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if you don't know what Eritrea is, that's basically like a coastal strip of land. Uh, that had been owned by Ethiopia was then conquered by Italy and has since become its own independent country. You can actually see it on a map now. And uh, that had been colonized, I think, in like the early 20th century by the Italians. That was their first jumping off point 
And then from that territory, they invaded the rest of Ethiopia and conquered it in the mid late thirties. <clears throat> so Italian forces were stationed there. And when world war II broke out, the Italian forces stationed in Ethiopia expanded out into surrounding British territories. I think specifically they targeted Sudan and then British Somaliland. I guess I should mention that Somalia itself was also an Italian territory at this time. Where would British Somaliland have been? Uh, well, you got the map there, so you can see Somalia, right? Mm. So if you zoom into northern Somalia, you might be able to see Somaliland, which is a country that has declared independence, but it's also hasn't been recognized as independent. Looks like Google Maps doesn't recognize it. Well, shame on them. They should. <laughs> but basically, the northwestern chunk, you can kind of see how like the northern part of Somalia forms a horn uh -huh. that kind of points to the west. So that horn there in the north, that's Somaliland. And so that actually was originally a British territory. Points to the east. Points to the west. There's, you can see like a chunk of territory that juts out to the west. That's a part of Somalia. Oh. You can oh, see you it mean bordering. You're talking about this as the horn, not the yeah, part that's yeah. pointing toward the water. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I see that. So, so this whole the... section was Somaliland. Maybe it's this dotted line. These look like provinces or something. That could be. That's roughly where the border would be, so that's probably the case. So you can see where the dotted line is. Everything west of that it was and is Somaliland. Ah, uh, gotcha. So that was basically British Somalia. Mm -hmm. And then everything east of that and south of that was Italian Somalia. Mm -hmm. So you can see Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia were all Italian territories. So British Somalia was an obvious target for them when the war started. Mm -hmm. So the Italians invaded British Somalia and actually successfully defeated them. They forced them out and British forces were for forced to evacuate by sea into Yemen, specifically southern Yemen, which was at that time a British colony as well. So a successful effort there on the part of the Italians in Africa. But they also invaded Sudan to the northwest, which was also a British territory. And their hope was that Italian forces in Ethiopia would march north into Sudan and then eventually attack Egypt, which is immediately north of Sudan. So the idea was a kind of pincher movement. Italian forces in Ethiopia marching north into Egypt and then Italian forces in Libya marching east into Libya. And that didn't work out. <laughs> you know, the Italian forces in Sudan ended up defeated and they were forced to retreat back to Ethiopia. And then of course, Italian forces marching from Libya were also defeated and were eventually sent into a headlong retreat that was very nearly a complete collapse until the Germans sent forces to prop them up. And it was basically the introduction of German forces that really marked the true beginning of the North Africa campaign. That was really when things got interesting, because of course the Germans were better fighters, had better equipment and were better resourced. How come Italy got owned on both fronts? Oh, that's, that's a long list. I mean, poor equipment. Uh, the military was not nearly as well resourced as the German military. Uh, the soldiers were not trained as well. The officers were not trained as well. Uh, logistics were bad, you know, bad organization in that sense. Also itself a manifestation of bad leadership. Yeah, it was, uh, the Italian army was not in a great state at the time. And uh, even worse for them was that the logistics of fighting in Africa were very, very difficult. You know, the distances involved are immense. You know, it's kind of hard to tell looking at a map, but uh, that is very far away. <laughs> you know, that's a very long way to travel going from like, uh, say, one of the major ports of Libya and then into Egypt. It's also and keep in mind desert terrain, which is not ideal for driving and stuff. Well, I mean, it's better than, say, like forest or jungle, you know, in the sense that it's flat, it's not bad. The bigger problem was the lack of infrastructure. Oh. There just were not a lot of major roads or even rail lines that could be used to supply units uh, that were deploying well away from the ports. You know, the ports on the northern coast ended up being the major strategic objectives mm. because you could very easily supply units that were close to a port 
but the further a unit got away from the port, the harder it became invariably to keep them supplied. So basically the campaign was a series of battles over successive ports along the coast. And there was a lot of back and forth over the course of the North Africa campaign as one or the other side would take, you know, a port and then, you know, use that as a jumping off point. Now the Germans, you know, to kind of focus on North Africa for a minute here, the Germans were pretty successful in pushing the British back at first. You know, once the Germans were introduced, they were able to stabilize the front, uh, stop the collapse of the Italian army, and then go on the offensive. And they were able to pretty steadily push the British back uh, along the coast, back towards Egypt. And I think it was the Battle of Gazala that was the first time the British were able to kind of stop them. If I'm not mistaken. I'm, it's been a while since I've studied the North Africa campaign. But after that, the British were able to at least stabilize things for a while. Uh, but eventually the Germans started pushing forward again. And I think it was at that point, or maybe it was the initial offensive, I don't quite remember. I think it was more the initial offensive before Gazala. So what had happened is that there was an Australian unit that was isolated in a port called Tobruk. And uh, that Australian unit was able to hold out for an extended period of time. I don't remember exactly how long it was, but the Battle of Tobruk is definitely one of the famous battles in the history of Australia, if not also the North Africa campaign. So they were, you know, obviously they were able to receive supplies by sea, but otherwise they had been cut off and isolated from the rest of the British army. And the Germans besieged Tobruk for a very long time until eventually, I believe, they were relieved as the British forces pushed west. So the siege of Tobruk was a big battle that was famous, and the Australians were able to hold out. But later on, uh, after the British offensive after Gazala stalled out, the Germans started pushing forward again, and they were actually able to take Tobruk the second time. You know, the second time they were not able to, the British were not able to defend it. And so in that case, things were looking really dicey. And I think by this point, it was 1942 or so. And uh, this is where you get the Battle of El Alamein, which was a very large battle. I think it was the largest battle in North Africa up till that point. And uh, that was the battle where the British were able to stop firmly the German offensive into Egypt. And the British were very concerned that the Germans were on their way to conquering Egypt by that point. You know, they were actually in the process of evacuating Cairo. You know, they were burning documents, moving people out. Like there was genuine concern that the British army in North Africa would not be able to stop uh, the German army from advancing. I would add part of the been a, part of the advantage that the Germans had in North Africa was that they had a really good officer leading them. This was the famous Erwin Rommel, and uh, he's one of the most famous German generals in the war. And uh, he was very good. He was like one of the leading experts in armored warfare in the war. And he was able to defeat the British in several battles despite being himself outnumbered by the British. Such was his skill. And pretty much the only thing that really stopped him from winning outright was logistics. Like the German military did not really care that much about North Africa, so they tended to focus resources on Eastern Europe uh, for obvious reasons. You know, the Soviets were kind of taking up most of their resources at that point. So the Africa Corps, as it was called, that was sort of the German army in North Africa, was kind of perpetually under-resourced as a result. You know, when they could get enough supplies, they generally did pretty well. But over time, uh, they were kind of restricted. And that limited their ability to kind of fight with the British successfully. He was able to make it as far as El Alamein, which I think itself is actually in Egypt. Uh, but he was stopped stone cold there. And he was never able to move forward again after that. Because it was around the time of the Battle of El Alamein that Operation Torch happened. Are you familiar with Operation Torch? No. So Operation Torch was a major, I think it was the first major Anglo-American operation of the war. And it involved a combined Anglo-American invasion force landing in Northwest Africa, specifically in French Africa, which was something that the Vichy French government did not particularly appreciate. But they also didn't really want to get into a war over it. So they basically complained bitterly, but didn't do much. Uh, that said, some Vichy French forces did fight back, but in some places they didn't fight at all. It was kind of a mixed bag. It was 
a very disorganized defense on their part. But regardless, uh, the Anglo-American landing force was able to pretty handily overrun Morocco and Algeria pretty quickly. And they started moving into eastern Algeria towards Tunisia because uh, the major port uh, in North Africa for the Axis was Tunis, which was the capital of Tunisia. And uh, that was the area that was expected to be the principal crux of the Axis defense in the region. So the landing in Northwest Africa created a new front in North Africa. You know, before the Germans had been focusing exclusively on the run on the one front that they'd been fighting uh, in Egypt and Libya against the British. But now they had to split their forces to fight the British and the Americans who are now fighting in Northwestern Africa. So that forced them to basically go on a permanent, to go permanently on the defensive. Like Rommel was never able to go on the offensive again in say Libya and Egypt. And after that, it was just a series of defeats uh, as the British army pushed them further and further west. They actually had a little more success in uh, Algeria. And uh, there, they were actually able to win a major battle against the Americans uh, at a place called Kasserine Pass. And Kasserine Pass was the first major land defeat uh, of the US Army in World War II, uh, at least in sort of Europe, you know, maybe not so much in the Pacific. Obviously, there was a lot of defeats in the Philippines and Burma and whatnot. But as far as like in the German theater, you know, the European theater of war, so to speak, Kasserine Pass was the first major defeat for the United States Army. And uh, they got bloodied pretty good, and that kind of shut down the offensive for a while until they could regroup and get new forces in. Uh, it was after that that they put a guy named General Patton in charge. And that was actually the first major combat command that General Patton had enjoyed. And he was able to lead the American forces much better after Kasserine Pass, and he was eventually able to lead them to victory. So after that, it was basically just a slow advance of allied forces, British forces from the east and then Anglo-American forces from the west, slowly converging on Tunisia. And eventually the Germans were isolated in the city of Tunis and they evacuated it. You know, I don't think there was like a major battle for the city. They just left because they would have, they preferred to preserve what forces they had and focus them in Sicily. And so that's, uh, that was the North Africa campaign in a nutshell. And I think the North Africa campaign concluded in late, early 43. I think it was early, early 1943 when North Africa was successfully cleared. But there was also fighting in other places. So specifically, I mentioned Ethiopia. So when war was declared in 1939, Italy immediately jumped in. And well, actually not immediately. I think they waited until like, they did kind of a bitch move. They waited until France had basically been defeated. And then like right before France surrendered, they declared war on France <laughs> and then tried to invade Southeastern France, which actually failed. You know, most of the French army was uh, in tatters at that point. And so they only had like token border forces available to defend against the Italian invasion, but that was actually enough to defeat the Italian invaders. So the Italians had to wait to get their pound of flesh, so to speak, until the uh, peace was negotiated with the Vichy French government. And then they were able to get some of that territory along their northwestern border. But uh, other than that, they also went to war at that point in 1940 against Britain with Britain. And so they invaded Egypt from Libya, like I mentioned earlier, but they also invaded British Somaliland from Ethiopia. And like I mentioned, they were successful in doing so and were able to focus on invading Sudan after that. So after that, things went to shit pretty quickly. You know, the Italian forces were defeated in Sudan, they were pushed back into Ethiopia. And after that, uh, the British basically collected an all-star team of colonial forces. Uh, that's me joking, by the way. It was not an actual all-star team. But basically, the British didn't have a lot of forces available to invade Ethiopia and eject the Italians from Eastern Africa. So what they did is that they picked up colonial forces from different parts of the empire and relocated them to East Africa for the offensive into Ethiopia. And so these forces were largely South African and Indian, as I recall. And I think there might have been an Australian unit as well. 
So South African units were predominantly white English. I think, I mean, it's the 1940s. It kind of goes without saying that they're almost all white, especially the officers. But in South Africa in particular, they only really trusted the English descended community in South Africa to actually fight for them. So they created all white units of English South Africans, not specifically Afrikaners. I don't think there were any major Afrikaner units fighting in all of World War II, specifically because they were concerned that they didn't like the British and might sympathize too much with the Germans. Is Afrikaners, they're speaking that language or is it an ethnic group too? Uh, yeah, it's an ethnic group as well. They're the people who were descended from the original Dutch colonists yeah, who originally settled there. Afrikaans is very similar to Dutch language wise. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, they maintained their ethnic group over time and it still exists today. Mm -hmm. But because they were invaded and conquered by the British, like they did not want to be part of the British Empire, there was always a little bit of bad blood there. You know, you can kind of look up the Boer War if you want some more details about that. You know, the families of the Dutch rebels were even put in concentration camps, one of the earliest examples of concentration camps. So there was a lot of butthurt about that. <laughs> and, the, and the British were a little concerned that maybe some of the descendants of those Boers uh, may not particularly desire to fight for the honor and glory of the British Empire as they fought against the Germans. And a lot of Afrikaners kind of felt a little more sympathy for the Germans because they kind of had more in common with them linguistically and culturally. So they were not required to fight for the empire, but the English speakers were. And so when you see South African units, it's generally English speaking or English descended South Africans who are comprising and manning those units. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a division of South Africans that were mobilized. And then there was a unit of colonials from Kenya, I think. You know, there was not nearly as many British people living in like Kenya, Uganda, and some of the other East African territories. But there was some, there was enough that they could be rounded up and impressed into a new unit. And so that unit was created. It was largely comprised of those sort of uh, British local colonials. So there's a South African unit, an East African unit, and then I want to say an Indian unit, which actually was mostly manned by Indians, largely martial races. We can talk about martial races sometime if you want. That was basically a group of people that the British trusted to fight for them. Trust being kind of a major issue as the Indian independence movement took off. So all of the officers were white, but then the actual soldiers were mostly Indians of one ethnic group or another. So they were brought in as well into East Africa. And I, again, like I said, I think they also had an Australian unit somewhere. So these were not big units. These were not like big armies or corps. These were basically at most divisions. And I think really there was only one division, the one from South Africa. I may not even be remembering that right. I'm basing this off of stuff I read like 10 years ago. So I apologize if I'm getting the details wrong. But basically, they got this little team of colonial units together. And then they sent them into Ethiopia. And they were able to defeat the colonial Italian army there over time, over the course of, I want to say, 1940. And by 1941, they had successfully cleared East Africa of Italian forces. I think they also landed... Uh, by sea, they landed some of the British forces who had evacuated from British Somaliland uh, into Yemen. Some of those forces were still there, and I think they were landed in northern Somalia. I don't quite remember the details on that. Hmm. But basically, yeah, they had defeated the Italians, I want to say by 41, in East Africa. And it was pretty quiet after that. Don't think a lot of hiccups. <clears throat> So when you say African fighting, those are the two main examples, North Africa campaign especially, but then also this lesser known East Africa campaign. Partly because it ended so quickly. There was a lot of other dramatic stuff that happened after 1940 that uh, gets a lot more attention. Were there strategic reasons for fighting over each of those places or was it resources or just we're at war anyway and we have people here so we should fight? Suez Canal. Oh, okay. That was the main thing. You know, the Italian forces in Ethiopia were isolated. And uh, so they went after at Egypt. They went north into Egypt to try to help with the campaign there. Mm -hmm. But like I mentioned, that never went anywhere. They attacked British Somaliland basically just because it was there. You know, British Somaliland at that time was completely surrounded 
uh, by Italian territory. So it was just easy for them to attack it. And I don't think the British had it like well garrisoned either. It was probably mostly garrisoned for uh, defense against native uprisings and stuff. Is this, so that was, is this whole region important for, I guess it would be, if you're trying to get stuff from the UK to India, this would be the shortest rush? Yeah. You would go by yeah, water go, probably? for Go by Suez Canal and then through the Red Sea and then through the uh, Straits of, uh, what are those straits called? I don't Gilbert remember. Char? Is that what they are? No way. Here? Like by Spain? Oh, no, no, that's Gibraltar. No, I'm talking about down by Djibouti. Oh. Yeah, there's a strait there. I don't remember what it's called. Bab, Bab el Mandab Strait. Yeah. There we go. So that's a strategic choke point. So that yeah. also is very attractive. Straits of Adem. We got somebody in chat. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very useful choke point to control. So the Italians were probably also thinking of that. Yeah, so that's why Djibouti and Somalia and this whole area is also a key fighting point. So the two key fighting points are basically fighting over the two water choke points. Yeah. That makes sense. And I guess this would also be a trade route to Australia. Like, was that the original route that people took yeah. when it was colonized? Oh, yeah. Well, no, not Australia was like started up in the late 1700s. Mm -hmm. So the Suez Canal didn't exist at that time. It didn't exist until the late 1800s, like 100 years later. Mm. But yeah, after the Suez Canal opened, it was definitely like the main transport route for naval traffic, you know, be it military traffic or commercial traffic. Like everybody used the Suez Canal because it was just way faster mm -hmm. than going around the southern tip of Africa. So it was a very strategic choke point for that reason. Mm. Now, that said, during World War II, it was not as valuable uh, because the Axis basically controlled much of the Mediterranean. And that made it very difficult for commercial, well, for cargo ships or warships, for that matter, to traverse the Mediterranean without coming under attack. So if you look at Italy, right, you can see Sicily, the uh, big island out at the southern part of Italy. You can see how close Sicily is to North Africa, right? Yeah. There's a very narrow channel there between them. So that's the choke point that the Axis used to basically cut off uh, naval traffic moving from, say, Britain into the Mediterranean, traveling to Egypt and the Suez Canal. Mm -hmm. They did make some efforts to get cargo ships in and warships, but it was just too risky. They took a lot of losses, and it was clear very quickly that it was not worth the effort. So, you know, air power in that region just made it prohibitively expensive. You can actually see Malta right there. Malta was a British territory, and you can see how vulnerable it is. It's basically surrounded on three sides by Axis territory. You know, Italy in the north, Tunisia in the west, and then Libya in the south. So Malta was extremely vulnerable throughout the war, but it never fell. The Italians pounded it by air. You know, they sent lots of bombers to attack it, and they tried to choke off any and all efforts to supply it. You know, the aforementioned cargo ships uh, were very easy to destroy. And so Malta was basically like this little fort that was continually under siege throughout the war up until, you know, the North Africa campaign ended. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's to the credit of both the people of Malta and to the British military that they were able to hold out against those odds. You know, the Royal Air Force was able to kind of deflect a lot of the air assaults. And then periodically there were just enough convoys uh, of cargo ships carrying supplies coming to Malta and that made it out you know, that made it there without getting destroyed, that they were able to keep the island's people fed and supplied, uh, as well as the British military there. Hmm. So Malta, in a sense, was like a thorn in the side of the Axis and the Mediterranean. You know, the British were able to use that to some effect. Uh, they didn't really do a lot of air operations from there, as I, as I understand it, but they did use it to launch what were called e-boats. So e-boats were basically these very small boats well, not, not too small, but basically they were like these little patrol boats that they could launch and that carried uh, machine guns and sometimes torpedoes. And they would launch them out into the Mediterranean to go and raid Axis cargo ships and other traffic that was traversing uh, between Sicily and Tunisia. So that was a useful raiding outpost there for British special forces. 
But anyway, because cargo ships couldn't really travel easily through there, unless they were like desperately trying to resupply Malta or something, cargo ships throughout the war, pretty much, up until maybe like 43, 44, would actually just go around Africa. Because it was just too dangerous to send them through the Mediterranean. So the Suez Canal was not worth as much in the early part of the war as a result. You know, not a lot of traffic could really just travel through the Mediterranean. So traffic kind of fell significantly as a result. Yeah, if you control one of the choke points, then the journey is not possible. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean it wasn't important. You know, if the Axis could have gotten control of the Suez Canal, that would have made it very much easier for them to conduct operations in, say, the Indian Ocean and disrupt traffic there. So that would have made it harder to get like Lend-Lease equipment and supplies to the Soviet Union, uh, as well as supplies from Asia, uh, getting them from Asia into the West, you know, specifically Europe would have also been harder in that case. So it still had value, uh, but it just didn't have the same value it had before because it was basically closed down. Mm -hmm. So let's see, as far as other parts of Africa, North Africa, East Africa, there wasn't as much going on in like West Africa and Southern Africa. I basically already told you what happened in Southern Africa. That was basically the British trying to mobilize white South Africans to fight for them. There was a couple South African divisions that fought in North Africa and Italy, uh, but there wasn't really enough of them for more than that. But other than that, Southern Africa was pretty quiet. I think the only exception was uh, Madagascar. You're familiar with Madagascar, right? Yes, my parents' previous dog was a Madagascan breed. <laughs> it's French. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the so there's this you know it's a huge island. Like sometimes people don't realize just how big Madagascar is, but uh, the whole thing was a French territory. And uh, when France. How do I put that? When France surrendered and were knocked out of the war, there was some question about what would happen to French colonies. Because obviously the Vichy French government did not want to participate in the war anymore and were just out. They were done. But then there was also the Free French government that was formed by Charles de Gaulle, which was basically a government in exile that wanted to continue fighting in the war and did not want France to succumb to the Germans. And they set up now, the Madagascar? They did not. They did not actually. So Madagas Madagascar, specifically the colonial government in Madagascar, remained loyal to the Vichy French government. And really whether this, that or the other territory was loyal or not, largely came down to colonial governments. They could kind of choose themselves whether they would stay loyal to Paris or whether they would uh, declare loyalty to Charles de Gaulle and his new free French government. So in the case of uh, a lot of colonies in West Africa and Northwest Africa, basically the ones that were the closest to France, most of them stayed loyal to Vichy France. But then a lot of the colonies in the Pacific actually declared loyalty, actually uh, declared their loyalty to Charles de Gaulle. And I think actually the Caribbean colonies actually stayed loyal to Vichy France. Uh, but then the United States basically just didn't give them a choice. <laughs> basically made them declare loyalty to Charles de Gaulle after a while. That's kind of a whole conversation unto itself. Uh, also, St. Pierre and Miquelon stayed loyal to Vichy France. I don't know how many people know where St. Pierre and Miquelon are, but they're actually two islands that are, again, controlled by France that are just off the coast of Newfoundland. So they're very close to, well, they're basically right in the vicinity of Canada. And they're a vestige of the original French Empire in Canada. They used to be a part of Quebec. But after the French were expelled from uh, Canada and Quebec, uh, the British allowed them to maintain control of these two little islands, St. Pierre and Miquelon. And so they still controlled them at the time. They actually still do today. And those islands, well, the government of those islands declared their loyalty, uh, declared for the Vichy French government, which actually led Charles de Gaulle to invade them in 19... 42, I think it was. It was some. The weird thing about the Free French invasion of Saint Pierre and Miquelon is that he did it without telling anybody he was going to do it. 
So he had he didn't have a lot of forces like available to him because you know he didn't have like a country right that he could tax and whatnot. Like all of the forces available to him were basically given to him by the British and the Americans. So all of his equipment and whatnot. The only thing uh, that he really controlled were the French personnel who had declared for him and who were uh, under his command, under his direct command. But with the limited resources he had available to him, he actually full on invaded these islands off the coast of Canada. And people were pretty, well, I shouldn't say people were upset about it, but I should say the American government and the British government were upset with him because they hadn't given him any warning. He just kind of did it out of nowhere. So that's how they were able to gain control of those two islands. They also, and this this operation they did with permission of uh, the British and American governments, they tried to invade Congo, specifically the Republic of Congo. I believe that's what it was. And uh, that was a part of what was called Equatorial French Africa, which had a different colonial administration than French West Africa, which is uh, which was uh, the northwestern part of Africa. <clears throat> so Equ they tried to do this amphibious invasion, this amphibious landing on the west coast of Equatorial French Africa, using purely French free French forces, and it just failed catastrophically. Uh, it was a total defeat. I think they did that in like 40, 41, you know, something like that earlier in the war. It did not go nearly as well as the invasion of St. Pierre and Meek Vuillant, unfortunately so. So Equatorial Africa remained under the control of the Vichy French up until much later in the war. I think around like uh, 43, maybe 44 or so. Because basically when the uh, North African colonies of France were taken as a result of Operation Torch in 42, uh, the equatorial colonies pretty quickly just declared for Charles de Gaulle after that because it didn't make much sense at that point uh, to continue pretending to be loyal to the Vichy France given that they were just utterly cut off from them. So that was relatively easy after that once North Africa fell. But other than that, Free French landing, the attempted invasion of French Equatorial Africa. I think the only other fighting I could think of uh, happened in the center of Africa, weirdly enough. So there's this country called Chad, and uh, it was a part of French West Africa. But as it happens, uh, the colonial administrator in Chad actually declared for Charles de Gaulle. And so they were able to establish Free French forces there. And what they did then is that Free French forces started raiding some of the surrounding territory from there. So they raided some of the surrounding colonial French territories in the rest of French West Africa. And then they also helped out the British army in North Africa by sometimes raiding the rear of German forces that were operating uh, in Libya. So there was actually some fighting then in and around Chad and in Central Africa as a result but it was never that substantive. And that was a very difficult area to operate from due to lack of infrastructure and whatnot. You know, just limited raiding by special forces groups was as much as they could, as much as they could manage pretty much. So I think that's about all I could tell you about Africa then. East Africa campaign, North Africa campaign, some of the free French operations in Equatorial Africa and in Chad. Oh, I forgot Madagascar. I didn't finish talking about Madagascar. So Madagascar stayed loyal to Free French, the, or no, stayed loyal to the Vichy French. And uh, when Japan entered the war in December 41, Madagascar became a major concern for the Allies because uh, they had a major supply line that ran, that ran sorry, south of Africa because everybody was going around the Cape of uh, Good Hope because the Suez Canal wasn't open. So what's right next to South Africa? Well, pretty much Madagascar. So given that Germany and Japan were allied, and given that Germany had a lot of influence over the Vichy French, it was not outside the realm of possibility that the Vichy French would allow Japanese submarines to operate from Madagascar, from which they could raid allied supply lines running through that area. So the allies started planning the invasion of Madagascar, and I think that they used free French forces exclusively. Maybe they used some British forces as well. Uh, but regardless, in 1942, uh, the Allies invaded Madagascar. 
And uh, there wasn't too strong of a French colonial garrison there. You know, again, it was mostly there to prevent native uprisings and whatnot. But the invasion took several months just because Madagascar is massive, which was my original point. Madagascar is way bigger than you think it is, probably. Yeah, Chad also pointed out Mercator projection for the Google Maps and a lot of other maps that you look at, which means that the closer you're looking to the equator, the more accurate the land size is, but the further you are, the more it gets stretched. Yeah. So Africa, for that reason, is misrepresented compared to, like, say, Scandinavia or something. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Madagascar is a... It would be interesting to see a overlay of a U.S. state or something against Madagascar. We can do that. Because there's a website that specializes in just comparing the size of things. The true size dot com. That's what it is. So you could very easily just type in Madagascar and it'll pop up here and you can just move it around the map as you like and it'll kind of show you how big Madagascar is relative to, say, Europe or the United States, all of which are also on the map. Hmm. So it's quite large. It's basically most of the East Coast. It covers most of the East Coast of the United States. Damn. Southern Maine to Northern Florida there. So north to south, very long, and then it's pretty wide too. Good chunk of the eastern U.S. there getting covered. But eventually Madagascar did fall. You know, they were able to take the island. And I don't think there were any combat operations there afterwards. So the North Africa campaign, East Africa campaign, the invasion of Madagascar, the attempted invasion of equatorial French Africa, and then occasional free French raiding from Chad. I think that's pretty much all of Africa in World War II, or at least most of it. That's what I know anyway. Let's put it like that. Now I could also throw in the uh, British raiding of the French fleet uh, in North Africa. That happened after the French surrendered in 1940. So the British wanted to keep the French fighting. And uh, when it was clear that the French were going to basically be conquered by the Germans, the British government pressured the French government into releasing the French Navy. They wanted them to command the French Navy to depart French territory and sail to, you know, either Britain, maybe the United States, or just another neutral country of some kind, basically to ensure the French Navy was not available uh, to the Germans and to, if possible, allow them to continue fighting with the Royal Navy. Now, for the most part, the French government and certainly the French Navy were not interested in doing that. <laughs> and so, for the most part, they refused. And that was a source of great concern for the British government, because again, they were afraid that the Germans would get a hold of the French Navy and would use it against the British. And so, the British government made one of their more controversial decisions during the war which is to have the Royal Navy attack the French Navy in port in North Africa. I think specifically it was like a Mergabel something. I don't quite remember the name. I think it was near the port of Roran in uh, Algeria, if I'm not mistaken. So the British Navy uh, sailed there and they actually gave the French Navy in port an ultimatum. They said that if you don't surrender your ships or scuttle your ships, uh, then we're going to sink them. And uh, the French admiral in charge rejected the ultimatum, and so the British opened up and destroyed a good chunk of the French Navy in the Mediterranean as a result. And that was hugely controversial as a result. You know, the French people obviously didn't like the Germans and were upset at being conquered, but uh, they were also very upset at uh, what they see, what they saw as perceived British opportunism. You know, it was kind of a stab in the back from their perspective, at least for some of them anyway. So that's another Africa note I could make there. But yeah, otherwise there, you know, Africa, Africa just did not have enough infrastructure to make fighting over it really viable. Like what fighting there was, was pretty close to the coast generally. Would roads be the most important type of infrastructure or other stuff too? Railroads. Railroads, that's the main yeah. one. Yeah, railroads allow you to move significant quantities of supplies over very long distances very efficiently. 
And in a place as big as Africa, that's especially necessary, but they just didn't have a lot of railroads at that time. So that meant that you were largely road bound. And roads were not that great that, you know, they did have some roads, but they weren't that great. You know, they were very old and generally low quality. They were not generally even paved roads a lot of the time. And there's just inherently a limit to how much traffic you can send along, you know, a small road. So without railroads and given the limitations of existing road infrastructure, which was itself not very extensive, it was just almost impossible to conduct large scale operations within Africa. Mm -hmm. We need more roads. They're pretty handy. Excuse me. They're pretty handy. But they're also expensive to build in places that have, that don't have them. <laughs> it's especially expensive to build big highways that actually have enough capacity to really allow for large-scale military operations. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's Africa. We're doing okay on time? Yep. Got about 30 minutes. About 30. So what do you know about uh, the Italian campaign? Not too much. Like the stuff that Italy tried to get done. I do know that there were some hints of it during this uh, discussion about the theater in Africa that they didn't really do too well relative to their ambition of like, we're going to take care of this area, you take care of that area. It seemed like Germany had to bail them out a bunch of times. All of the time. All the times. <laughs> All of the times, yeah. Pretty much. It never it never really worked out well for them. You know, even from very early on in the war. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that uh, the Italians did after they jumped into the war was uh, invade Albania. Or no, not Albania. They had already colonized Albania by that point. That was an Italian colony. So they invaded Greece. That's what it was. So Italy invaded Greece in, I want to say, 1940. And they managed to make some headway. They took some territory in northern Greece, and then the Greek army stopped them. And then the Greek army started pushing them back. And then the Greek army started pushing them back into Albania. <laughs> so at that point, uh, Mussolini actually requested German assistance. And that actually helped delay the start of Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the Soviet Union. Now, there were some other factors, too, that contributed to that delay. You know, there was also uh, a coup in Yugoslavia. A pro-German government had been overthrown by a monarchist, well, by monarchist elements within Yugoslavia that were generally more pro-Western. And uh, Germany didn't like that. So between the coup in Yugoslavia and the failed and failing Italian invasion of Greece, uh, the Germans felt that they had to delay Barbarossa and divert resources into the Balkans. And the result was the German invasion of Yugoslavia and then the subsequent German invasion of Greece. And the British tried to rush what forces they could into Greece to try to help them fight off the Germans if not also the Italians, but they just couldn't get enough forces there to really make a big difference. And they ended up getting overwhelmed. They were able to retreat successfully to the island of Crete, which is not too far from Greece. It's one of their largest, I think it's the largest Greek island that they control. So there was hope that the British might maintain control of Greek islands in the Eastern Mediterranean, certainly Crete, but they ended up getting surprised. The Germans conducted their largest uh, paratrooper operation of the war. They dropped a huge number of paratroopers onto Crete Island, and those troopers were able to successfully defeat the British defenders of the island. Now, while that was a big victory for the Germans, since it gave them a pretty good foothold in the Eastern Mediterranean, it was also catastrophic for the Germans. Because even though they won, the German paratroopers took so many casualties that uh, the German paratrooper 
core, such as it was, ended up being effectively uh, knocked out of the war. You know, they just took too many losses for them to continue as a major combatant, and it took years for them to rebuild. So they didn't really come back until much later in the war as a force. Now, after that, what was after that? Well, anyway, the Germans jumped in, bailed out Italy, they invaded Greece, etc., etc. That's the rest of the war for the Mediterranean is kind of its own story from that point. Now you found it, huh? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, yeah so... you can just right you can right click the colored countries and they'll disappear. Uh -huh. And then you there's a little search bar there and you can type in a country's name and it'll pop up for you. But anyway, Italy, yeah, just uh -huh. did not do Look at well. the, the shift in it as you drag it toward the equator. Oh, yeah. Oops. So you can take a country like uh, the UK, and you can drag it down to the equator and see how big it really is, you know, compared to countries there. Mm -hmm. But then you can also take a country on the equator and then move it up north and just compare it directly to countries there to see what the distortion would look like mm -hmm. if it were located further north. Yeah, you can see how much it shrinks, right? Yeah. UK, move it down. Yeah, the UK is about the size of Madagascar. Maybe smaller. I'm curious myself. Ah, uh, yeah. Let's get Russia. Russia is pretty far from the equator. Yeah, Russia is definitely interesting. You can see how much it kind of curls at the top. In, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like if you added up the contiguous United States plus Alaska. Oh, can you get Alaska in this? Wow. Alaska is pretty huge, damn. Very much so. <laughs> yeah, it's like all the west coast of the United States plus Nevada, Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado maybe. Such a crazy trade deal. I feel like Alaska is going to gain in value over time. If climate change gets worse and people think about moving away from the equator. New just, frontier for us in the waiting. Yeah. Well, like the the cost of the dollar per square mile of Alaska was one of the most insane trade deals of all time. Oh, yeah. It was very cheap. Wasn't I it mean, because like Russia was in a really bad spot or was it? The, USSR. Uh, the Russian government needed money. I think it was because they were trying to implement a modernization program. Mm -hmm. It was like Alexander II or something. It's trying to modernize Russia. And then I think there had also been a lot of money that they'd spent to try to free the serfs, since I think serfdom technically ended under his rule. Mm -hmm. So I think part of that involved buying them off, you know, paying their previous masters for them. Mm. So I don't remember the details, but yeah, Russia needed a lot of money. And so selling Alaska was a quick and easy way to do it. And they didn't really need it or want it. It's not like there was anything particularly valuable there, at least nothing that anybody knew about at the time. A lot of people in the U.S. were actually upset at uh, Johnson, the president at the time, for buying Alaska because they didn't see any point in it. Mm. I mean, why are you wasting money buying all these glaciers? You know? Yeah. <laughs> they don't have any value. Isn't there oil there and stuff? Yeah. But they yeah, no way up north. Time. No, no. Oil wasn't really even a commodity considered worth exploiting until, what, late late 19th century? Probably more early 20th century. Mm -hmm. I think gold was the bigger deal in Alaska. They actually did find gold, I think, like 10 years after we bought it. Mm -hmm. So there was actually a big gold rush up there as a result. I think it was called the Klondike Gold Rush, something like that. But yeah, very good buy. 
pretty much paid for itself, given all the gold they found. It was not an American state, though, until after World War II, because there was a big, there was a pretty good population boom in Alaska because of the war. And so a lot of people were much more interested in statehood after that. Why did the population boom in the war? Uh, well, it's kind of forgotten now, but it actually was one of the major fronts in the Pacific theater. And so there was uh, a need to defend it and garrison it accordingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the shortest distance between the United States and Japan is actually north along astride Alaska. And so it was assumed that if Japan were going to launch some kind of attack against the United States, then it must then, well, most likely then it would probably pass through or near Alaska. And actually, that was one of the head fakes that Japan did during the war. Uh, you know, they were going to attack Midway, right? So they were planning that operation. But in order to misdirect the United States about their intentions, they actually invaded two islands in the Aleutians' chains. The Aleutians Islands are those islands sort of southwest of Alaska. You know, they're all a part of Alaska, too. So the Japanese actually attacked two of those islands, Atu and Kiska, and I think maybe a third one. And they actually stationed Japanese forces there. I think it was the only example of actual Japan. I think it was the only example of actual American soil being occupied during World War II. Yeah, you can kind of see them there, Atu and Kiska. And uh, because that was along that path, that was along the shortest distance between Japan and the United States, the Japanese were trying to send a fake signal there that they were going to launch some kind of operation against either Alaska or maybe even the west coast of the United States. Hmm. And the idea was that the Jap the idea was that the United States Navy would then redeploy forces up north to try to deflect that possible invasion. Now, of course, the United States uh, had code breakers who were able to break the Japanese code, and they were able to figure out that they were planning to attack Midway. So all of that effort ended up getting wasted. But uh, even after that, they continued to occupy the islands for a while. And it wasn't until, I think, 43, maybe? 43 or 44 that the United States actually invaded the islands and took them back. I think in the case of Kiska they evacuated the islands beforehand, so there was no fighting. But there actually were Japanese defending Atu. So the Battle of Atu actually saw the United States take pretty substantive losses, not just from Japanese defenders, but just because of the extreme climate. It was just, it was very, very cold. Where is Kiska? Ah, uh, that's near Atu. She's got Atu, and below it is Agatu. Uh, Let's see, maybe west of it? I'm not sure exactly. Bering Island. Here, let me do Kiska. Kiska, Aleutians. Zoom out here. Oh, yeah, it's east of that, too. Basically, the next big island over. Oh, I see. In the it. Rat Islands. Yeah, yeah. So, those are pretty close to Japan. You can see why they were an obvious target to yeah. try to misdirect the United States. Yeah. But even after that, uh, the United States basically did the same thing to Japan. <laughs> they turned the tables on them, took some of their islands. No, after they took back uh, Atu and Kiska, what they did is they started launching air raids uh, from the Western Aleutians on targets in northeastern Japan. Hmm. And, uh, you know, it wasn't anything too serious. They didn't really have the range to get very far into northeastern Japan. I think mostly it was like the Kuril Islands and then maybe like a little bit of Hokkaido. But by continuing those raids, the United States was kind of signaling that there were bigger operations being planned, that they might actually invade from the north uh, to attack northern Japan and stage landings there to invade the homeland. And of course, getting in, and of course, the homeland getting invaded would have been a big deal. So the Japanese actually had to dedicate a pretty good chunk of their air force to northern Japan to try to deflect not only the air raids, but also to hedge against a potential surprise invasion of northern Japan. Mm -hmm. So that acted as a pretty nice, successful distraction there for American forces fighting in the South Pacific, who were slowly moving their way closer to southern Japan, which was the actual target 
uh, of American plans for the invasion of mainland Japan. So it was kind of a forgotten front, but the Aleutians in the Northern Pacific were always an active part of the Pacific theater. These islands would be quite small, but you could still probably like park ships next to it and land a aircraft on it. Oh yeah. Yeah. They cleared airfield. They cleared land and had airfields and stuff. Yeah. Mm. They're the bigger problem is not so much the size. The bigger problem is how rocky they are. Yeah, the terrain. Yeah. But they were able to carve out enough space to kind of make it happen. Yeah, there's a navy town on Atu now. Oh, really? Yep. Navy town and the Coast Guard station. Atu Island Airport. And they have an airport as well. Yeah, I remember I saw a documentary a long time ago. I don't ex I don't remember exactly what it was about, but there was actually there was an American veteran who had fought in the Battle of Atu to take the island back from the Japanese, and he actually went back to the island. Hmm. And they were actually surprised to find a Japanese memorial there. Like uh, some Japanese had come to the island at some point and put a memorial uh, on the island for the Japanese soldiers who had died there kind of remember their sacrifice in the battle mm -hmm. and this u.s veteran was not he wasn't mad at the japanese per se but he was a little bit upset that there was not like an american equivalent on the island to remember the sacrifices of american veterans yeah it's an interesting thing too in the the mindset of people honoring the soldiers that fight and die because i feel like if you're born in a country you're pretty committed to where you are and then service of your country people would consider to be a noble and good thing to do but then if your country has uh, delusions of grandeur and they're trying to take over the world and stuff then you're going to be the baddies basically mm -hmm. but you could still more or less honor the the dedication and the commitment and the camaraderie of the combatants even if their their cause is not necessarily good. War is pretty ugly in that sense. Fortunately so. Yeah. I didn't even know there was fighting up there. Yeah, we talked about it a little bit when we uh, did that big Pacific Theater thing a couple years ago. Yeah. But it wouldn't have been where any of the biggest most iconic battles were no but still no. clearly an important front because if it's causing them to need to dedicate resources then that's going to weaken them relatively elsewhere yeah exactly so that's what the japanese tried to do as far as scaring the united states into thinking an invasion was coming and then the united states did the same in return later on mm -hmm. so yeah it worked i'm not sure how we got onto that uh, oh, you were talking about Alaska. Yeah, I, I talked about it because we were looking at the size chart. Right. And Alaska is pretty big, but Dude, it's also yeah. pretty far from the equator. So I was curious how big it is. And it's actually pretty big. And then you, we connected the World War II with the Alaska. There we go. Okay. Yeah. I'll do some backtracking. How did we get here? <laughs> it's just tangents on tangents. Yes. You know, one of the fun comparisons here is looking at Russia next to Brazil. Because it gives you an idea of how much smaller Russia is than you think it is, but also how much bigger Brazil is than you think it is. Brazil. Yeah. Let's see. Well, this one doesn't really change much because it's already on the equator. Yeah, damn. Can you rotate this stuff? I don't know if you can. Man, so. Brazil is like oh. the size of the U.S. You can rotate it. You just have to rotate the little compass on the bottom left part of your screen. Oh, I see. Nice. Yeah, look at this. It's not all inhabited maybe as much as the U.S. I guess the U.S. has a bunch of area in the center where almost nobody lives. But yeah, it's 
basically bigger than the U.S., at least the contiguous U.S. It is. It actually is pretty good deal bigger. Total size is squ square mile 3.3 million. U.S. is 3.6 million. Sounds about oh, right. Oh, for U.S., does that include Alaska? Yeah. Oh, good point. Yeah, because if you add Alaska, the U.S. is more, but I think without it. Brazil is the largest contiguous territory in the Americas. Yeah, so largest contiguous is Brazil, but then if you add in Alaska and Hawaii, U.S. is more. What about Canada? Let's get Canada. Wouldn't Canada be bigger? I thought that was the largest. I think Canada gets squished big time. And it also has a bunch of water up in the north. Ah, uh, yeah. Like a lot of this point. stuff. Yeah, Baffin Island and whatnot. Yeah, Canada squishes a lot. Canada. Total size, 9.9 .9 million kilometers squared. So I think Canada is bigger than contiguous U.S.? Oh, yeah, yeah. Easily. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I thought it was uh, the second largest country in the world after Russia, which means it would be bigger than Brazil, I would think. Largest country then, in the Americas and largest surface area of water. Why yeah. does it say largest country in South America and the Southern Hemisphere? I guess it's because some of Canada's islands are not contiguous. Yeah, I guess so. So Brazil is the largest contiguous. Canada is larger if you add in all the islands. And it has the most surface area of water. There you go. Canada's pretty big. The population, though, is really funny. It's like all right at the border, or at least a huge portion of it is. Like 90% of the population is within 50 miles or so of the U.S. border, I think. Yeah. I wonder if that'll be another frontier as well in like a hundred years. If Canada's mm, going to get a big population boom. There already are a lot of countries like we mentioned six uh, living in the Vancouver area and stuff. And we, we had some as our landlord. Oh yeah. in Surrey. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty good dudes. One I of the things buy. that I noticed about them was the the grandpa of the family i don't think he was the owner of the place but it's pretty common that you like if you have extra money you have a room and your grandparents or i guess your parents if you're the homeowner can live there and he would go for walks a lot of the time and he had a really long white beard and he would also wear his turban and whatever and just go for walks and thinking about man that's a really good health practice but it was also really beautiful there we lived when it wasn't raining mm -hmm. chat saying greenland is pretty small let's get it oh yeah it's yeah, another one that gets distorted a lot greenland looks enormous on the map uh, oops that's still you remember when the pretty big that's you remember when the next car you remember when the Trump administration tried to buy them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they made that effort. Never went anywhere. I don't think the Danes were that interested. And I don't think the native population of Greenland was that interested either. Yeah. So it never went anywhere. Greenland's population is pretty low, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's like 100,000, something like that. 56,000. Yeah. Not much. Yeah, I think the U.S. built like a big radar early warning station there. Way back in the start of the Cold War. It was part of one of the early defense lines they set up. It was like a whole line of uh, radars they set up in like northern Canada and Greenland to try to detect Soviet bombers that might try to come across the uh, Arctic. Hmm. Is it hard to fly over the Arctic, like due to the cold weather? Uh, it can be done. I think the bigger problem is more like uh, the weather being erratic. Mm -hmm. 
like uh, lots of high winds, cloudy weather, what have you. Also, there's probably some weird magnetic phenomena up there. But yeah, as far as if you can prepare the plane properly, then I think it actually can be done. I don't think it's too big a deal, per se. Mm -hmm. Like bombers could have done it, if that's what you mean. Bombers could have definitely flown over the North Pole and then just bombed the shit out of us and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, it was technically possible. Yeah, I guess you just wouldn't really have very much refuel and support underneath you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's because of this Mercator projection. I wonder if there's a globe map. It might be easier to get to a globe map. Or does Google Maps have that as a setting? The globe? On a 3D one. Earth 3D map. Travel around the world. Can I change the projection? This still looks like a Mercator projection. Google Earth. Launch it. Because the Arctic looks huge. Oh, here yeah. we go. It looks crazy huge, but if you're looking at like Cold War threats, why is it spinning so much? Cold War threats, Russia is here. Yeah, they could basically go over here into Canada and the US. They also have this point. So yeah, definitely going over Alaska would be the shortest rush by air mm -hmm. into the US. East Coast is still pretty far away. Yeah, Canada is pretty deep from north to south. To go Very over so. Greenland would get them more kind of over the Atlantic Ocean. Nice thing about going over uh, northern Canada is that you get around some of the more obvious defenses. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can kind of see them coming if you come through like the North Atlantic or the North Pacific. Mm hmm. So the North Pole is a little more remote. Yeah. Although these days, radars are sufficiently good that it's not too much of a problem detecting them one way or the other. Chat saying polar flight paths were mainly of concern for ICBMs. Yeah. Yeah, these days. Yeah, ICBMs weren't really a thing until the mid-late 50s or so. Mm-hmm. So before then, it was mostly bombers they were worried about. Yeah, the U.S. thought that uh, the Soviet Tupolev-16 Badger, NATO codename Badger, that was the one of the first major bombers that the Soviets built. They were convinced that it could make it to the United States, albeit on a one-way trip. They didn't think it could fly here and then fly back, but... They thought it had a, at least enough total range to fly all the way to the United States, drop a nuclear bomb, and then you know crash land somewhere or something. Mm -hmm. So that's what a lot of people in the national security establishment were kind of worried about in the early, early part of the Cold War in the United States. They didn't find out until much later that actually the Tupolev-16 did not even have enough range to make it here, even on a one-way trip. So it turned out they'd been worrying about nothing. Yeah, it wasn't until later with the uh, Tupolev-95 that the Soviets really had the ability to send a bomber over here. And by then, it was more like mid-late 50s or so when they had to introduce that. Yeah, it does take a lot of work for the propulsion to get some heavy damage dealing stuff over that great of a distance. Even more so if you want to be able to get the plane and pilot back. Mm -hmm. And then the the bigger it is, the easier it is to detect because of how much heat and energy it gives off. I think we talked a little bit about the different size of bombs and stuff. That was one thing that was kind of a concern whenever the war in Ukraine was first starting. It was like, 
nuclear escalation, what is the actual uh, destructive capacity of Russia versus the US, etc. And how a lot of these crazy tonnage bombs that people were mentioning, they're not really practical in the sense that if it's just this huge behemoth of a thing that maybe could destroy a whole bunch of stuff, that makes it really loud on the radar profile. Kind of like the, what was the V1 that we were talking about? Yeah. For Britain, it's like, it's if it's really slow and hot and loud, then people are just like, oh, well, I guess we should handle that. Yeah, pretty easy to detect. Mm-hmm. So there is a question from chat. Can you ask Agent Smith if he heard a scandal about a drug dealer called Marcet who was freed from Dubai because a Latin American government lent him a hand? First I've heard of it. Huh. Marcet, Dubai, drugs. No, I'm not getting anything. When did that happen, Leslie? When I come on and hear this guy's voice, I immediately start taking notes. Amazing knowledge. Hell yeah. After Agent Smith last week, you were talking about India and stuff. I was explaining that for a lot of people, they'll be hooked on some kind of TV show or whatever. And leisure time is great and wonderful and have fun with that. And I'm not saying don't enjoy TV shows, but one of the things that you do for fun that a lot of people would consider to be work is catch up on current events and then read about world history and how that is something that you're self-motivated to do just in your leisure time. And if mm -hmm. you keep doing that over time, then you end up amassing this huge body of knowledge. And I think other people, they do have large bodies of knowledge, but they're not necessarily nonfiction historical type stuff. Mm -hmm. So maybe you know like a bunch of the different lines of what people said in the TV show Friends. It's not really gonna help you in a, a class setting most of the time, but it is knowledge yeah. of some kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just kind of accumulates, I guess. Can you share a link here? Yeah, you can, as long as it's safe for work. We did talk about Ukraine at the start here. So this will I go did. on YouTube and you can see the beginning of that. I, I did send you a map in Discord. Mm. It just shows uh, some of the radar stations the US built in the early Cold War as an early defense mechanism. That's a lot of them. Yeah, so all okay. along this top border here. So basically, as soon as something did take that short rush route that we talked about, they would mm -hmm. have picked it up at the north edge of Alaska and then what's basically the contiguous part of Canada. Yeah, I'm going to send you another one here. So I think the pine tree line was the earliest. And then they started moving progressively north because it's really hard and expensive to build installations way up north in the Arctic like that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they really wanted to do it until later on, if I'm not mistaken. Unless so they've got the dew line, which is at the very top, the mid Canada line, and the pine tree line. Yeah. If something like a missile did fly over, what would the procedure be for shooting it down? Like an ICBM? Yeah. Nothing. You can't really shoot them down. <laughs> oh, why not? Can't you send Too hard. at it? No. no. Oh. I mean, the missile flies way up high in the strata. I mean, low orbit, basically. Mm -hmm. So unless you can catch it like uh, in the early phase when it's first launching... Uh, the only other option is basically to catch the warhead as it's coming down. Mm -hmm. 
and the warhead flies extremely fast when it's in that terminal phase like that. It's basically, you know, trying to shoot down a uh, warhead from an ICBM as it's falling is like trying to shoot a bullet with a bullet. You know, the speeds involved, the physics involved are just very difficult. You know, the U.S. has been working on anti-ballistic missile technology for like half a century now, and we're still very far from having anything resembling like a truly workable system. Hmm. We've had mixed results. You know, we do have some systems that have intercepted uh, warheads like that before, but not consistently. I passed the link along about the uh, released... Uruguayan oh, drug dealer on Discord. Oh, Marset. Okay. I was Googling the wrong name. Oh, actually, I do remember that. Yeah, that was that Colombian guy who got killed. Yeah, eventually all of those early defense lines were rendered pretty much useless by um, ICBM. Mm -hmm. You know, it was still worth having them to detect ICBMs that might be coming over the Arctic, but the Soviets figured out a technology that allowed you to basically fire an ICBM into low orbit and then have it basically just travel in any given direction around the world uh, to come and hit a target from a different direction than they might expect. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to fire them directly across the shortest distance to the target. You could say, fire it south and have it go south under the Soviet Union into low Earth orbit and then basically orbit all the way south under the South Pole and then come back up and then hit a target somewhere coming while it was coming up from the south. Mm -hmm. So that meant that radars in the north would be rendered useless because they could just launch all the missiles under the South Pole and then have, have them you know, strike the United States uh, coming up from the South like that. Mm -hmm. So the way that the United States eventually got around all these problems is uh, satellite surveillance. The United States built a bunch of surveillance satellites that were sufficiently sensitive that they were able to target ICBM launches pretty much wherever they happened. Mm -hmm. And in that way, it kind of stopped mattering whether or not you could, uh, well, it stopped being as pressing uh, that is to say, the need to try to detect incoming missiles. You know, you could just detect them on the ground, basically, as they were being launched, and then just track them from there. And I think that was a capability that was developed in the late 60s, maybe 70s or so. Mm -hmm. So before then, they were still dependent on radar for early detection. In other words, that, you know, line of radar, as well as probably a system of other radars deployed around the United States. I think we still keep them. You know, it's not as though radar is useless. You still need it to kind of track uh, missile traffic or aircraft and whatnot. So we do still have that capability. Uh, but satellites are definitely like the bleeding edge of that technology. That's what we lean on more than anything. Yeah, Chad's saying that the ICBM reentry goes Mach 10 plus. And for reference, SR-71 could do Mach 3.2. So it goes way faster than planes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you want to shoot it down, you're going to have to develop something that moves pretty fast and that is very nimble, because the adjustments you're going to have to make as you approach uh, a ballistic missile, as a warhead that's moving that fast, it's going to, they're going to be very nuanced and very finite. Like, it takes a lot of control to be able to maneuver into something moving that fast, especially something that's that small. It's not a big target. <clears throat> so just very difficult, a very difficult technical problem. There was a general question about endgame of Taiwan. Uh, will China go to war to occupy the island? This one comes up a lot just because uh, China's... It's been in the news a lot. Yeah, it's been in the news and China's pretty loud about a lot of the claims that they make regarding yeah. it but it seems like mostly bark and less bite we did talk mm -hmm. about how 
China doesn't really have the naval capacity to do a naval ground invasion. A lot of their navy is patrol boats for their own like defensive purposes, but not really yeah. like to do a full scale Taiwan invasion. So for now, it seems like it's more talk and posturing and soft pressure of just trying to leverage their sphere of influence in the way that they talk about it and the way that they negotiate rather than looking to do some like full on military stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, they lack the capacity to really do a major invasion. There is reason it could succeed anyway. The Taiwanese military has its own problems. But, you know, crossing the Taiwan Strait is no mean feat. Mm -hmm. It would be very difficult. And uh, the United States would likely be a complicating factor if we did jump in there and try to defend them. So from the Chinese perspective, it's much less risky and much easier just to use economic pressure to lean on the Taiwanese government and get them to voluntarily accede to Chinese suzerainty. suzerainty? Whether or not that actually... What does that word mean? It's basic control. Oh. It's de facto Chinese control over the island. But even that could be a stretch. I mean, everybody in Taiwan sees what happened to Hong Kong. So nobody really puts much, puts much faith in the Chinese government's notions of uh, two systems, one country. So there could be a lot of resistance to that, even if it made a lot of economic sense to just integrate into China. But yeah, the Chinese government, I don't think is really ready yet for an invasion. You know, I think for one, politically speaking, the government is a lot more worried about uh, getting Xi Jinping his third term here. That's going to officially happen with the upcoming conference mm -hmm. of the uh, Communist Party of China. And so there's probably a lot of political maneuvering going on uh, regarding that, that they would much rather be focused on right now. So Taiwan is not top of their agenda. There is some reason to think there might be a window within the next 10 years, which would be ideal for them to invade. Mm -hmm. Because the United States hasn't really been investing too much in its naval capacity for the past couple of decades, and it's starting to now. And we'll probably start getting new capabilities that will allow us to much more readily uh, defeat various area denial systems that the Chinese military is working on. So once we develop those new capabilities, which will probably happen with you know sometime in, in the next 10 years or so, uh, it's going to be a lot harder for them to take the island. So they'll have an incentive then to try to invade before them. But for now, they still need to big up. They still need to build up rather more transport capacity, more air assets, uh, you know, just better leadership, better op officers, better trained personnel in general, really. I mean, unless the United States or the Taiwanese government do something really belligerently stupid, the Chinese government will probably not invade Taiwan. It's just too risky for them. There would have to be something dramatic that happened within Chinese politics, I think, for a leader to come to the fore that would actually want to do that. We learned a word today. Suzerainty is a relationship in which one state or another polity controls the foreign policy and relations of a tributary state while allowing the tributary state to have internal autonomy. The dominant state is called the suzerain. So China has some of this control over Taiwan and some of the relations of it, but Taiwan still has a lot of its own internal systems. Well, Taiwan is totally independent politically. You know, when I talk about it, like aside from an outright invasion, then the only tool really that China has is economic influence. Mm -hmm. And a huge amount of Taiwan's economy is tied into China's economy. You know, they get a lot of investment from China. A lot of people in Taiwan travel to China for work. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stuff Taiwan makes is sold in China. So it's a, they're very closely integrated economically right now. And that gives the Chinese government a lot of leverage that it can bring to bear. So Hong Kong so it, would be a better example of a suzerain state. Uh, kind of in so much as that's part of the one country, two systems model. Mm -hmm. Although technically even there, it's fully under their control. So maybe suzerainty isn't the best word. Oh. Maybe uh, bringing it under Chinese sovereignty would be a better choice of words on my part. Hmm. But yeah, I don't think an invasion is likely. You know, if the Chinese government, the Chinese government has to kind of uh, do a whole 
security theater thing whenever there's something like a visit by a high level American official to mm -hmm. Taiwan. You know, they just have to reiterate their claim to Taiwan and illustrate that they're committed to reintegrating the island into China. Mm -hmm. So that's partly a diplomatic thing so that they can signal to the United States that it's not going to tolerate any drift from Taiwan. But it's also necessarily <laughs> politically uh, for China, Chinese politicians specifically, uh, because within the context of Chinese politics, if you're not tough on Taiwan, you might say, then that could cost you support politically mm -hmm. within the Communist Party of China. Or more likely, it'll be used as a bludgeon against you by your political rivals within the party. Mm. There's always a lot of jockeying within authoritarian political parties like the Communist Party of China. So any weakness that can be perceived in you will be used against you by somebody who wants your job or somebody who wants one of their people in your job. Mm -hmm. So it really behooves you to try to signal strength on the Taiwan issue as a Chinese politician, almost regardless of context, mm -hmm. so that you can deflect to that pressure. But that doesn't mean that they're planning to invade. That's just noise, basically. Yeah, talk is pretty cheap, but it yeah. can get you a lot of points. Yeah, exactly. You know, I suspect that if China did try to invade Taiwan, they would probably do it slowly. I think we I think I showed you before that one island that Taiwan controls that's right next to a major Chinese city. Do you remember that? Mm, I can look. So the city's name was Xiamen, and it's spelled X-I-A-M-E-N. So you can just Google that, and it should take you right to it. So you can go, you can kind of zoom into the city, and immediately southeast of the city is a big island, which is called Kinmen Island. There's a couple others too, but the big one is the main one, and that's actually controlled by Taiwan. And you can see how close it is to China as, Taiwan as well as has to Xiamen. It has Kinmen, not Xiamen. Oh, oh, Kinmen is yeah, right over there. Yeah, yeah. So you can see how close the island is to the city mm -hmm. and how far the island is from Taiwan by comparison. Yeah. So if you're China and you want to test whether or not the United States is really committed to Taiwan, or if you just want to test the Taiwan government, seizing Kinmen would be a good start. Yeah, I remember you talking about this region specifically when you're talking about salami tactics. Yeah, uh, yeah. They could just occupy all of this water out here and basically cut it off. Mm -hmm. without even necessarily attacking it conventionally. And they could just yeah. be like, well, you can't defend this, so it might as well be ours kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So they could take a couple islands there next to Simon, mm -hmm. and that would be you know, very hard for them to respond to, given how close the islands are to China. Mm. And then if the reaction were not sufficiently strong, then they could push out and take some of the other islands in the Taiwan Strait. And then maybe they could just keep going from there, just based on how strong the response is. Mm -hmm. Now, I've read more recently that maybe one of the lessons that China takes away from the war in Ukraine is that if you are going to start a war, go all in. You know, don't half-ass it at the start and just kind of predicate your invasion plan on a lot of rosy assumptions. So in that sense, maybe it's less likely now that they'll go for salami tactics. Maybe they do just go all in from the start then go right for the mainland. Mm -hmm. That's possible. But it's just kind of hard to judge how they're thinking strategically about a potential invasion right now because Chinese politics is just so opaque. You know, We can't really know for sure. Yeah, well, one of the things that we saw with Russia invading Ukraine was that the Western countries, Europe, the US, you're going to make a lot of enemies if you attack someone's ally even if you don't necessarily get a military reply back at you so mm -hmm. it would hurt china economically a whole bunch and probably more than it would benefit them just from taking it yeah because, yeah they get some tech stuff but then you become a world villain basically if they do that mm -hmm. yeah at least with the west anyway <laughs> yeah so could they do it yes would it be a good idea for them probably not are yeah. there some people who believe that they should do that? Probably, yes. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's yeah, like a rabid nationalist is going to have kind of an expansionist attitude. Yeah, exactly. 
So the technical capacity is questionable. That is to say their capacity to actually carry out an invasion. Diplomatically, it's not really the best idea. Mm. Economically, the benefits are pretty dubious. So all in all, an invasion is probably not likely for another couple of years, I would guess, mm -hmm. just based off of what I've read. And even then, it's doubtful. It just doesn't really get them much benefit. There would probably have to be a really desperate government that was just trying to save itself by doing something that would appeal to the nationalist crowd. Mm -hmm. you know, somebody like that I could envision maybe gambling with a major operation like an invasion of Taiwan. But in general, Chinese politicians and Chinese political culture are very risk averse. And this would definitely be very risky. So if only for that reason, I doubt it would be very likely. Well, cool. We had a nice uh, World War II tour with some tangents and some size comparisons with uh, Mercator projection being the main antagonist there. <laughs> What was that site called? The true size? Yeah, the true size of. That's a fun little playground there. Yeah. Well, nice. Appreciate your uh, expertise today, Mr. Agent Smith. Uh, chat and YouTube commenters, if there's a particular part of World War II that you want him to flesh out a little bit, that's definitely something that could be done. I don't know if we've talked about the uh, Americas that much if there is anything happening in South America yes we could no fighting no. Oh. <laughs> no combat but yeah there was a lot of diplomatic maneuvering uh, a lot of trade regulation I guess it sounds boring but it's more interesting but uh, there was also a significant amount of espionage hmm. and a large amount of uh, contingency planning for the potential uh, for a potential outbreak of war in South America. So, yeah, there was stuff going on. Hmm. Very last-minute question. Would the housing market in China crashing in the next year create said desperate government that might make them want to try something like that? I don't know if they would even be able to at that point. No. <laughs> but I don't think the housing market is likely to crash. I'm, I suspect they would be able to take sufficient policy action to stop or mitigate a major crash. I think the bigger problem would be the cost of mitigating. So rather than the cost being borne by the citizenry in the real estate market, it would probably be deflected onto the country's balance sheet mm -hmm. and possibly onto a significant amount of moral hazard. It would probably result. Mm. But yeah, I think it would probably be manageable. But yeah, as far as like an economic collapse, it's possible. It's possible that a government could be desperate enough at that point. But I would also point out that Xi Jinping has been going out of his way the past 10 years uh, to shore up his support within China's political system. You know, he is pretty much the shining star of Chinese politics right now. And it's very difficult for people to challenge him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even in a worst case scenario where the economy just goes plunk, he may still be able to deflect pressure given that he's basically turned it, uh, China into his own personal little fiefdom. Mm -hmm. And is he very hawkish? Nah, not really. He's been shifting towards more of a hawkish diplomatic stance, but that's that has more to do with changes in policy preferences within the party. Like starting around 2015, the party decided that uh, something needed to be done about the pressures that the party was facing from outside of China. You know, economic, political, technological, etc. And so after that, they shifted gears and started trying to put more pressure on countries around the world to try to help them uh, suppress dissent and otherwise refrain from criticizing the party. Mm -hmm. So Xi Jinping, yes, has been more hawkish, but that's been something the party as a whole has kind of shifted towards over mm -hmm. the past, what, seven years or so. So overall, not that hawkish, I would say. Certainly the rhetoric has been hawkish, but that's done more for domestic political reasons. Look, I'm not actually threatening you in a military capacity. I just need to build some clout right now with my voters. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk some mad shit, but it's not personal. 
Yeah. yeah, the the uh, North Korea school. Well, not even North Korea. North Korea doesn't do it for domestic reasons. Maybe Russia would be the better example. Mm-hmm. You know, Russia does the same thing, but it's almost all for domestic political consumption. Yeah. Ooh, look so, how yeah, tough China's been, being on America. Yeah, China's been doing a lot of that. Mm. So yeah, I think if the United States kind of signaled that they were not interested in defending Taiwan, that would significantly increase the likelihood of an invasion mm-hmm. because the U S is the principal block right now. But so long as the United States makes clear that there's going to be consequences and that there's at least some chance of military intervention, I think the Chinese government will refrain from invading. Mm. Cause even if they have a lot of military leverage, given that that's right in their neighborhood, it would still be very risky and a u.s response could be very damaging especially economically given that the u.s could basically just blockade china's coast may not be able to blockade all of it per se but we could definitely hit the major choke points in southeast asia Mm -hmm. and that would make it very difficult for ships to make it there it could just make trade very uncomfortable for them as well as everybody else by extension but yeah technically it would work so yeah that's not something i think the chinese government really wants to risk right now they're a lot more focused on technological independence economic development and trying to deal with the shadow banking sector which we talked about a couple shadow weeks ago. banks yeah shadow banks yeah so those are bigger priorities right now rather than some big foreign policy misadventure that'll probably just end very badly for all the parties involved you heard it here first. You heard it here first, folks. Agent Smith believes China invading Taiwan is a bad idea, and they have bigger problems with shadow banks. Yeah. Well, cool. Somebody in ch- chat was saying, uh, "Isn't China trying to dominate poor countries through investment?" I was going to say, um, "Not really anymore." I mean, not really even in the first place. A lot of the Belt and Road Initiative was not like a push for dominance. It was more about industrial policy. You know, they wanted to create markets for Chinese goods, especially goods that were in sectors that they had targeted for uh, development, you know, like uh, rail, for example. You know, the Chinese government wanted to make China one of the world's leading producers of high-speed rail equipment and technology. And that was one of the technologies and markets they wanted to try to dominate so that they could move up the value chain of the economy and uh, have higher paying jobs and a more developed economy generally. So, you know, high speed rail uh, ports to a lesser degree. Ports was more about just easing access to markets so that China could buy stuff from countries more easily and so that those countries could buy from China more easily. So basically investing in local infrastructure to facilitate more trade more broadly, which China disproportionately benefited from, given how much China imports and exports, Mm -hmm. but also uh, investing in stuff like infrastructure projects that are more politically sensitive, like, say, the African Union headquarters in Ethiopia. That stuff was just more about building political capital and trying to build relationships. So, you know, China's foreign policy in general is just more about win-win as they call it you know deals like you get something we get something but it was not really about dominating you know they didn't want to like put countries into debt slavery for example because that was never going to work like if your country owes too much debt and is facing a default on chinese loans then just don't pay them (laughs) there could be a broader economic crisis that results but that hasn't stopped any number of countries from defaulting on loans to western lenders over the past couple decades Mm-hmm. So there's not really any reason to think Chinese lending would be any different. It seems like they're in it more so for the money than like establishing full political control of regions as a result. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So facilitating trade, creating markets for Chinese exporters, and then trying to build ties more mm-hmm. generally so that maybe they could influence them into not criticizing China or maybe helping them deal with dissidents. That's more of the issue they're interested in. But like full dominance, no. That was never really their objective. And a bigger problem is that, what, a couple of years ago, they figured out that, uh, well, they realized that the Belt and Road Initiative was not really returning much in terms of value. Like the diplomatic leverage they were getting was not much. The economic leverage was not really manifesting. A lot of countries were borrowing money to build projects and then just not building them because of corruption. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason that the IMF has lots of prerequisites 
uh, to get a loan, right? They only lend to you if they think you're actually going to use the money such that you'll be able to pay it back. China didn't do that, and now they're kind of getting burned and learning the hard way. So that's resulted in a significant withdrawal of resources from the Belt and Road Initiative. They're not spending nearly as much money on it as they used to be. Still investing a lot more in it than the United States is in any kind of equivalence, and that's probably helping Chinese, China relative uh, that's helping Chinese influence relative to American influence, at least in that regard. But overall, the program is more on the decline right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the Chinese government has things that it would rather spend the money on anyway at this juncture. So no surprise in that sense either. Cool. We get a last minute visit of uh, Taiwan. Well, thank you very much for your time, sir. Another yep. splendid episode of World Discussion with Agent Smith. Map size yeah. edition. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Always a privilege. I'm sorry it was a little discombobulated and uh, we didn't have a lot of direction today, just kind of wherever, pretty much. Yeah, we meandered around a little bit. If you have any corrections for us in the YouTube comments or you want to leave us a glowing or scathing review, feel free to do so. And we will see you on the next episode of World Discussion with Agent Smith. Smith. Yep, thanks again. See you next time. GG!